Good evening and welcome to the April 24th, 2017 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please take the roll? Mr. Dupree? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Oglis? Here. Thank you, and please note that in the absence of Mr. McGee, Ms. Hendrickson will be a voting member this evening. Uh, the next item is approval of minutes from the April 3rd, 2017 meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Our first action item, Risbera Properties LLC requests a sketch plan review for a residential subdivision at 31 Dresser Road, Assessor's Map, R31, Lot 18. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just know, this is a residential subdivision uh, proposed for property on Dresser Road. The uh, property is in the RF district, and based on some of the site characteristics, it's required to go through a conservation subdivision design process. Um, so that's what they've um, developed as part of the sketch plan review. Um, staff reviewed the comment or reviewed the application materials to date and provided um, some comments for the board to consider, just in terms of uh, really looking at uh, how this site relates to uh, surrounding properties. Um, we also identified in discussion with our interdepartment meeting that there is a old cemetery on the site that was identified, and I believe the applicants are already aware of that and may have already field located that. I'm not sure if that's occurred yet, but um, they are aware of that. Um, outside of that, I, I think I'll turn it over to the bank <coughs> chair. Um, as you said, this is sketch plan, so there is no formal action by the board uh, on this item, but rather beginning of a discussion. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, we have a few of those tonight. Yes, we do. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Rivera Properties, LLC. We're here to talk to you a little bit about a proposed subdivision off of Dresser Road. The process is about 27 acres in size. It has uh, about 512 feet of frontage along Dresser Road. The rendering that you see up on the screen and the one that you see here on the board represents the conservation subdivision layout. And as Jay mentioned, uh, with the ordinance requirements and the fact that we do have over an acre of wetlands on the site, uh, we are required to go through the conservation subdivision process. So part of that is to also include a traditional subdivision layout, which would be uh, the appropriate size, lots, and frontage for uh, properties in the RF, the Rural Farming District. So this is a traditional subdivision layout. It ends in a hammerhead. We have uh, our access coming in off Dresser Road, pretty straightforward plan. Uh, the lots all meet the ordinance criteria for uh, minimum lot size in the RF District. As you can see on the plan, there are wetlands that are located in various spots on the site. So we have a band that comes through right in the middle here, got some here, here, and up in this little corner here. <coughs> Those wetland areas were recently delineated by Mark Hampton, and the uh, rendering shows a couple of different colors associated with it. The darker green color in the middle is the actual wetland. Then there is a lighter area outside of it, which is a 25-foot upland buffer. And then on some of the renderings, you'll also see there's a white line outside of that, which is an additional 15-foot uh, building setback for that. So all of the wetlands on both renderings do show that uh, 25 and then the additional 15 around it. So this is, as I mentioned, a traditional subdivision layout. It's about 1,300 feet of road frontage. Uh, excuse me, uh, 1,300 feet of road length with a traditional plan. <coughs> Back to <coughs> the conservation plan, you'll see that that is about 200 feet less, so a little over 1,100 linear feet uh, associated with the conservation layout. So the road got a little bit shorter. 
The crossing on both of those plans, if you see uh, for the wetlands, is about in the same location. We expect it's probably going to be about 2,400 square feet of wetland impact associated with that crossing. We do have just the one crossing that we anticipate uh, as part of that. So again, the road does still terminate in Hammerhead. We have 10 lots proposed as part of the subdivision. The density calculations are included uh, in your packet that shows those deductions. As part of the conservation plan, we also need to provide for open space that is uh, at least 50% of the lot area. We do have that. There's about 13.73 acres of open space with this plan. A large portion of that is off to what would be sort of the southeast, if you will, end of the site <coughs> off the hammerhead here. The sort of green area here. You'll also note that it envelops around the perimeter, making this open space area all contiguous. It's about a 50-foot strip at the most <coughs> minimum point associated with that. And it does encompass the wetlands that are uh, identified on the site. So we've got sort of a wraparound uh, with the open space. The property does require that we have wells and septic, so we will be doing um, an evaluation for the, for the septic systems on the site. And <coughs> one of the uh, uh, series of comments that we had, we'll talk a little bit about each one of those, but I just want to highlight on the uh, cemetery that Jay mentioned. We did receive the information with coordinates on those points based on the uh, police department's records in their files. So we've roughly identified based on the coordinates that that little spot right there uh, is the potential location for that uh, cemetery. With that information, we will be going back out to see if we can identify any things and more accurately locate it uh, to show it on part of the plan. Uh, but that is, uh, has been identified, has been addressed based on the information we have thus far. So we're at the very beginning stages of this process. This, we are here for sketch plan review, but I did want to touch on some of the comments uh, <coughs> that were identified in the memoranda for this. Um, I'll skip down to uh, the third bullet. I think we've talked a little bit about the first two. The wetlands were delineated by Mark Hampton. It is less than five years ago. They were done within the last year. Uh, we will be providing information in a letter associated with his delineation as part of our submittal. Um, and that will talk about the vernal pool uh, analysis as well. And the next one is with regard to interconnections. And I did want to touch on that a bit as well about the surrounding properties that are here. <coughs> Along this edge right here is the common open space associated with Kennebago subdivision. That's Kennebago Drive that comes in off of two ride roads. So all along that edge right along here is the open space for Kennebago subdivision. And on the back side right there is just a little narrow strip that about a piece of property owned by Mr. Cordner. He actually has the majority of his land is actually off of Two Rod Road as well. It's a little bit closer to the turnpike. There's quite a ravine and a drainage course that goes through. You folks who are involved in reviewing Kennebago, you remember that the open space and sort of all the drainage kind of goes down into that uh, same area and then down towards uh, the turnpike, etc. Other side here, see right here is on by um, uh, Swinburne. And it is a sizable parcel. There is a Trout Brook Lane, I think it's called, that comes in off of Beach Ridge Road that <laughs> provides the access to that uh, now. And it looks like there's another, at least one, possibly two rights of way that come into that as well, looking at the tax map information. Looking at the terrain and the topography, we didn't feel that connectivity to that piece really was warranted given the, given the terrain on that. But um, that sort of our global picture of what is happening around it. We can certainly provide more map information for you as part of our submittal, but I just wanted to kind of talk <coughs> things on that. <coughs> One of the next comments was with regard to traffic management and a recommendation that the driveways for lots 1 and 10, those are the first two lots in off of Dresser Road, that the driveways for those be limited to the internal subdivision road, and we would agree with that, that that makes sense. Uh, from a management standpoint. 
Uh, again, we talked about the, the cemetery. We will be going out looking for it based on the coordinates uh, that we had found, and we'll actually locate it more precisely to show in the plan. And uh, we did uh, uh, take note of the recommendation requirement for a nitrate analysis, given the fact that we do have uh, proposed septic systems uh, in the subdivision. So the question came up about the frontage on lot six, which is at the end of the road there. That 115 foot dimension is measured only along the side of the railway. It does not include the end. We know that that is not, um, cannot be counted as prior frontage. So it does meet the standard requirements without inclusion of that end uh, for that. And the last comment was with regard to two lots that are shown on this view here. Um, the first one is what is highlighted right here. I was there, uh, construction company lot. That lot was created uh, 17, 16, 17 years ago. Uh, the applicant purchased it in order to build a house for a customer. So they have it um, right in this area here. That's a lot that was purchased by their construction company to build a home on that existing lot of record. <coughs> the other lot is down in this area here. This one was recently uh, created uh, by the prior landowner uh, and purchased by Vizbera Brothers Construction uh, in order to build a house for a customer on that lot. That house has been constructed and new homeowners actually own that home now. Uh, so that is shown on the plan, uh, but that is not part of this proposed subdivision. So with that, I would like to take any comments that you folks have. We certainly would love to get your input and feedback as our next steps will be going into more formal design. Thank you. Susan, do you have anything? Yeah, um, let's go to the last first. The Vizera uh, Brother Construction Peak property. The ones to the left and the right are not part of this development. That's right. So if they get, they are going to be developed, it'll be completely separate from anything we're talking about today. The two lots are single lots. They wouldn't be further developed. There's a house on one and one on a construction on another. What about the two that are up in what I would call the wetland area? The Bear Properties LLC, there's a couple of parcels. Mm -hmm. Can you? I have them on. Can I, can I think of? No. Up. If, if, you, if you follow the road as proposed, yeah. it crosses the wetland. Yep. Before it crosses the wetland, to the right. Right here? Yeah, right in there. There's a couple of parcels. Or it has got at least two. Yeah. That's the note that identifies the whole parcel. It's the total area of the oh. How would I have known? Okay. Um, because I had a bit of a hard time understanding, uh, hearing you, frankly, <coughs> let me view the um, open space connections with the um, Kennebago subdivision. Did you say that there was going to be some attempt made to make some connections through that? Can you hear me okay if I... Yeah, take that with you. Can you hear me? We'll switch on the button. How's that? Better? A little better, yeah. Okay, we'll try. More for the, more for the TV. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. <coughs> All right. Hopefully this will work. So this line right here, right. which is 973 feet long, is the line that abuts the open space for Canadago subdivision. This area here that's shown all in green mm -hmm. is the open space for this subdivision. Right. So is there going to be any attempt to actually encourage, you know, trails, et cetera, et cetera, that might go I mean, to combine them is what I'm looking for? Or is it just going to be feel free? There aren't any formal trails in the Canabango subdivision. Uh, so if, I'm, if I'm in this new subdivision and I want to go over into the Kennebago subdivision and to, <coughs> to enjoy their open space, it's not a problem. 
it's typically connected. This is the lot owners association for that piece of property. Right, I understand, but sometimes you don't enter on somebody else's property without permission. Right now, there is no formal agreement between this property, which would be held by the landowners in this subdivision, and that one. I'm not sure that it couldn't happen in, in the future, but there wasn't any formal plan to merge the two open spaces because this open space is held by the Lawn Owners Association for Canabango. I'm concerned about the fact that they're abutting each other and in a period, over a period of time, people are going to want to move back and forth between the two of them. And I just don't want to have there be a loophole as to who's going to be over you because it's not part of your subdivision. That's all. I will forward that on to the attorneys. Okay. Um, You did agree for the lots, uh, the access for lots one and ten, and the cemetery is quite clear. Um, the nitrate analysis has been noted, right? Yes. I'm not too sure about what you had said about the lot six frontage clarified. 100 foot footage uh, frontage minimum may only be counted along the side of the right of way, not at the end of the hammer. Correct. So if, if you can see on, it's probably hard to see on that smaller plant, but if you look right here, there's a dimension called out, it says 115 feet. Okay. The 115 foot dimension is measured only along the side of the road. There's another 25 feet that's not included in that 115 that wraps around the end of the road, but that cannot be counted as frontage. So it's not. Okay. Just be careful. And then um, the last one, the timing of the division of two with Barrow Brothers Construction Company Eagle Properties should be detailed to ensure the properties do not have <coughs> consideration as part of the same subdivision. I think that was our way of saying let's be careful. You're being careful. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to worry about coming back with any issues. Yeah, so I just wanted to just um, state that if it's my understanding uh, that the lot on the right hand side was created within the last five years. Right. So though it's already a created lot and someone else owns it, you know, we're not really looking at dimensional layouts per se, but in terms of its overall impacts to the subdivision, it's my understanding per state law that still counted as a subdivision lot. So um, yeah, so Again, uh, you know, the, the dimensions are that lot is laid out as it's laid out. We're not really talking necessarily about that per se, but, you know, it's, it's really a, um, I think, more of a, uh, a legal descriptor than anything else. But I just want so to make sure we are looking at this. So that lot have anything to do with us looking at this as a subdivision? It's really not, it's not part of what we're doing today. No, this lot is a standalone. This Bear Brothers Construction purchased this lot. They built a house on it for a customer, and the driveway comes in, I think, in this area here, right off Dresser Road. Okay. So I guess, as you had mentioned, if you're sending items along for the attorney to look at, I would suggest that be another, just so we have that appropriately noted on the anything that we get recorded. Okay. Along the same conversation, could I ask what the, what the delineation or the trigger is for consideration as part of the overall subdivision? Yep, so, yep. so a subdivision uh, is triggered when a lot is, when there's, when a lot is divided into three separate lots within a five year period. So that first division that was <coughs> described, that was just a simple land division, it's the next division. So if they were just to split this existing lot, uh, I can't remember what you said it was, 20 acres, let's say in half, that would create a subdivision of three lots. So, um, again, I don't know that it's going to have a, a great deal of impact in terms of design based on sort of that's over in the corner, but it is something we just want to be sure we're I'm doing. Okay. Thank you. Roger? Oh. <coughs> I'm all right. Okay. Robin? So, building on the, it's Jay, it's three lots within five years. Correct. So, uh, Nancy, you said that the one in the eastern corner was developed five years ago? The one on 
so this would be the northern corner right here? Uh, nope. Uh, I have a north arrow going. I'm going the wrong way. Yep, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, okay. the, nope, to the right. That's the one we're talking about. Yep. That's within five years, right? That's correct. And the other one that you just were on? About 16 or 17 years ago. 16 or 17 years ago. And how about the Kennebago up in up in that area there? Kennebago was developed. Five years ago. Five years ago in June. And Kenny Bagel was a separate parcel at the time. It Even though it's the same owner, though, Jay, could you talk to me a little bit about the the delineation there? It's. I don't think. I don't think that has any. I don't think that has would matter. Um, and based on the number of different uh, configurations that Risbera Construction Brothers goes under, it could well be under separate ownership. Um, um, and I'm seeing a head nod back there. They're pretty savvy about these things. But I also do believe because both these parcels are existing separate parent parcels that were considered uh, conforming at the time because they both had frontage. Um, uh, the Kenny Bell <coughs> property off two rod, if I remember correctly, and obviously this one off dresser, I don't believe it would have mattered anyway, but. Um. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the um, the wetland survey. Um, you said it was within the year. Mm -hmm. Was that a field survey or a desktop analysis? No, he went out into the field. He provided GPS points to us. So okay. And were vernal pools included in that scope of work? I need to follow up with him on that. Okay. And um, what was the total amount of wetlands that was delineated? Uh, delineated? Mm -hmm. I couldn't give you the total acreage. Okay. Uh, you hang on just a second, though. Okay. <coughs> I believe it's probably on the order of about Three plus acres. Okay. Three plus acres, and of those three plus acres, you said about one acre will be impacted? No, about 2,400 square feet. 2,400 square feet, okay. Um, how, uh, as part of the conservation subdivision, um, what we're looking for is <coughs> maintaining natural features and preservation, pre preserving uplands and wetlands. How has that been incorporated into your plan? If you look at the plan, you'll see that the darker area is here in these central locations are the wetlands that were mapped on the site. If you look at those areas, all of the lot lines, that's why the lines are a bit jagged on the lot lines, all of those lot lines respect a 25-foot upland buffer from those delineated wetland limits. We have provided a mix of upland in this open space area here along with these wetlands. We provided a 50-foot quarter as a buffer around the perimeter of the site. The terrain in this area here are some nice knolls, and then they drop off to the wetland area. So those are all set aside as, as open space. Our, our plans were black and white, so it was just kind of hard to see yeah. where that is. Yeah. So is the open space then? The dark green you said around the, the bottom, so it's wetland? Um, it's hard. They, they look much nicer on the screen than they do on the plane. Hopefully you can hear me now. This is the wetland. Could you grab the, uh, yep. grab the hand mic? <coughs> Viewing audience at home. Okay. <coughs> so, this area here is a matched wetland. This lighter area here is a 25-foot yep. upland buffer. The white area outside of that is a 15-foot upland no-build <coughs> setback. So that's matched around every one of the wetlands. So there's this one, this one, and these little ones down here. So then <coughs> this color green ties them all together. So it connects all of that with open space and provides, this is 50 feet here, that's an upland 
that's part of the uh, connection for the open space. All along here, this is all open space here, 50 feet here, the wetlands and the upland buffers, 50 feet down in this area here. So that's all the open space, which is 13.7 um, acres. Okay, and so what you're saying then is the, the 10 lots that are um, outlined there are not are all on uplands and there's no, the, the only impact is like 22,000 right square feet. It's right there at the nearest point to pass Got it. Um, on, fu on future plans, could, could you please um, identify the, um, the old cemetery and um, um, I guess some color and open space would be great too. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. As Rachel? I mentioned, we will be going out in the field to <coughs> locate that and put it on the plane. And, uh, the Kennebago development, how much open space do they have that would be contiguous there? I'd say it's probably on the road very close to the same side. Mm -hmm. so, Create a substantial. Twenty three acres. So this is twenty. Uh, this is thirteen. So. so it's pretty, pretty substantial contiguous area. Yes. Um, one observation as, you, as I look at that hammerhead, uh, that the configuration of lot six kind of rules out any sort of um, trail possibilities. Into the open space? Into the open space, because it, the way it, it lot six abuts that, that hammerhead area at the top. Well, we have opportunities for trails along here, which is all open space. Are you going to be putting in, is, is there any, any anticipated, any trails anticipated in that area? That's a pretty large upland area, and folks are going to want to be using it. Uh, we can certainly look at that. We hadn't anticipated it's so nicely wooded area there. So we hadn't anticipated a lot of clearing. We will have to do some for stormwater management as well. So perhaps we can integrate some of that in there. Thank you. Thanks. Rick? Um, I think the layout looks fine. Uh, as far as, is that the two wetlands that are connected underneath the road there? I mean, there's a lot of different definitions of wetlands as to how wet they actually are. Is there culvert under there or anything? Or I haven't walked that lot, so I don't know what exactly what it looks like. But, um, or is that just, does that road just separate those two pieces and go are right you talking right here? Yeah. That's our proposed road. So there's nothing there now. No, I know, but when you do put the road in. Oh, absolutely, we'll be there. Not now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the culvert is laying up there, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of questions, I think. Okay. That's a good time. Thanks. Yeah, I think this is fairly straightforward as these things go. Um, I think possibly most importantly from my perspective, you seem to be doing a good job of honoring rule number one on these things, which is avoid wetlands on private property um, in terms of actual house lots. So that's great. Um, and I think my fellow board members have pretty well covered most of the most of the key points here and I do appreciate the point by point walkthrough um, in response to the staff comments. That's always really helpful. Um, so we'll look forward to um, seeing the wetlands, uh, the uh, hearing about fernal pools in connection with the wetlands delineation, um, exploring potential for interconnection with uh, uh, open space and I know these things you know, it often happens a little bit more organically and not necessarily formal trails with a lot of clearings. But I think at um, the very least it would be nice to kind of clarify sort of the, as Ms. Oglis said, um, any sort of legal rights for, for um, crossing back and forth um, to the extent that that might be a consideration. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing the cemetery marked out on the revised plans. You've got the nitrate analysis that'll be ongoing. Appreciate the response on the lot six frontage. And um, there are a couple of kind of housekeeping items, um, just a legal front that you're going to check on. So beyond that, I don't think I have 
anything else? Um, is there anything more that you'd like from us in terms of feedback at this point? We'll just be moving forward with more detailed design, so um, we do appreciate your input. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it. The next item, Great Lots of Maine requests a sketch plan review for a residential subdivision at 725 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U29, Lot 7. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is another sketch plan for a, another residential subdivision, however, in a, in a different context than what we had just seen. This subdivision is in the town's um, village residential two district, which really envisions sort of um, more compact style development, interconnected streets, uh, pedestrian connections, um, sort of more more uh, formalized pedestrian connections, I should say, rather than trails, although trails and, and sort of integrated open spaces are also a key consideration, but not so much sort of the, the large uh, that we were just sort of looking at. So uh, as part of our staff comments, we provided a bit of overview of the expectations and, and design criteria that are in the uh, zoning ordinance. Um, I think in looking at this item, and I think a couple of board members are probably on the board. I know we're on the board a few years ago when this was before you um, under a different uh, applicant. Um, one of the key discussions we had at that time and still need to have is around access into the site um, and getting access off of Route 1. I know there's been some work either by this applicant or, or prior property owners to secure an easement to ensure they have a requisite 50 foot wide right away um, to be able to get in there at least with a private road and that's part of the discussion I'm sure we'll, we're likely to have here moving forward. Um, other elements to talk about is again uh, this Developer, Mr. Hollis has have been having conversations with some of the abutting property <coughs> owners, uh, particularly those along, really on both sides, but I think at this point uh, the folks on Lucky Lane, which is an existing private road slash driveway that provides access to three homes. Um, I think they've been working on trying to coordinate uh, access because I think as board members will note, with our recent review in this area of town with the Dunstan Crossing, traffic in this area can be difficult and that's going to certainly be something a key area that the applicant knows he's going to need to work on uh, as and if this moves forward into a formal application. Um, so let's see, I guess I should also just touch base on um, just identifying the fact that the property address is listed in the town's historic preservation uh, um, uh, section of the zoning ordinance. However, the map and lot and property really refer to the property next door, sort of, I'll say, to the south towards the Saco side. Um, so though this property is in, in the historic, uh, uh, is one of our historic properties, certainly I think due consideration to um, sort of uh, the relationship and coordination with that property is at least worth, worthy of mention. Um, let's see, and I guess the other sort of critical element to be thinking about is this property is in the Phillips Brook, Brook watershed, which we've talked about again before. This is one of our two urban impaired streams that the town's sort of currently undergoing study <coughs> of, and um, a watershed management plan, I should say. And so we'll want to be sure we're giving, again, uh, all due consideration to that. Um, and did I mention interconnectivity with the budding properties? I think that would be the other. <coughs> among among <coughs> many. <laughs> Uh, another one of the items that uh, we'll be looking at and considering. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay. And I'll hand it over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Paul Hollis. I'm the owner and developer of Great Lots of Maine. Thank you, Jay. You practically presented my whole um, project for me. Thank you. But uh, let me give the five points. Um, I'm going to come around, and hopefully I won't need this microphone. Can you all hear me? Could you grab the handheld, please? Really? Yep. It's, it's really more for the, I'm sorry. the TV it's broadcast. It's for the TV. Is it on? Mm -hmm. It is. If Thank it's you. not, we'll be told from yeah. our okay. friends in the back room. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the property, as you see here, 725 U.S. Route 1, the 23-acre parcel, this started out as owned by one family. It was 46 acres right here. This is the Agazarian property. This is the Dunstan Crossing property, Elliott Chainwoods property right here. Yeah, and we are just right down the road. 
This is the property that I have under contract. There's 23 acres here. Access, to talk about the access into the property, according to the deed, it was a 27-foot of frontage only that went with this property. There was another 24-foot easement that abuts the property that allowed me a 50-foot right-of-way. Ms. Caney, who's the president of this property, has rights to that easement. We're aware of that. If this project gets further along and this becomes a public roadway, that that easement would have to be purchased by me, and I would have to, of course, grant it to the town of Scarborough. To give you an idea, the survey was done by Steve Ross, a well-known surveyor in the area. Here's the 23-acre piece where we are. This blue pretty much represents what we're developing. The rest of this property beyond Phillips Brook is right about here. Stewart's Brook is down. It runs down this way. I think Stewart's Brook is identified right here, going off the property. The property is mostly pasture. Here's Lucky Lane, which is a driveway servicing three residences over here. This is Queens Drive right here. The property runs all the way up, 23 acres, 2,500 feet deep to the highway. Now for the subdivision. This project is truly in its infancy. I mean, we are really getting to know this property pretty well. Now that the snow has cleared, we're getting to know it even further. So we looked at the BR2 zoning. We know that there was a minimum of 5,000 square foot lots and 30 feet of frontage. We didn't want to do that. Quite small, of course. We wanted to create a community that could be affordable and at least have some room on some lots. Our lots are from 7,800 square feet to 25,000 square feet. Wetlands were delineated two years ago by Mark Hampton. The wetlands line runs this way. Probably about three acres of wetlands on the side here. We waited for the snow to melt. We wanted to go back out there. Usually in all my projects, my wetlands are usually delineated immediately, within a few months of me making my presentation. This was a two-year-old wetland delineation. I went back out there with Mark Sensi, another wetland scientist that I work with. And we discovered last weekend a couple of small wetlands along these areas, along here. So we decided to put on the brakes. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the whole property re-delineated. Again, fresh. So now exactly what we have for wetlands. All of this is going to be confirmed in the field. There's two small swaths right in this area right here that we discovered last weekend that weren't part of the original wetland plan. So it gave us reason for concern. We took a step back and we said we're going to get to go back. He's going at the end of this week and he's re-delineating the whole site to go back. So we think that obviously some of this might change. The net density calculation for just this front 11 acres is probably over 40 lots. We're not doing anything with the back 11 acres of the property. We know the requirement for open space is 10 to 20 percent. We're probably going to be somewhere around 50 percent. We know the dead end rule is 2,000 feet. We did our road 1,914 feet to the end. It was brought to my attention by Jay in an earlier meeting that Gordon Way and Thurston Way is considered part of the dead end. We weren't aware of that. We were told that just recently. So whatever adjustments have to be made to that or whether a waiver is going to be asked for, that's something that we have to determine. As far as connecting to other properties, the 50-foot right-of-way running to the other side to the Chestnut property, Gordon Way right here stops, but that would be when we come back in here. I think we're going to be here for two conceptual meetings, quite honestly, as we get further along with this. Gordon Way will connect the Segunte Jenkins property on this side. The roadway that we're proposing is 22 feet wide. There's public water on Route 1. There's an 8-inch duct tile line right here available to us. We've already met with Portland Water District. There's enough PSI to service our 31 lot division. There is sewer. Here's 
840 feet away, there's a sewer manhole right here to Mr. Chamberlain's property. The discussions are ongoing with him when that sewer is going to be turned over to the town. We're hoping that we're going to make our own arrangement that we're going to be bringing sewer down Route 1 to connect to the rest of the property. If God forbid we can't accomplish that, the sewer on the Route 1.0 is about 1,600 feet away. Well, we're pretty confident we're going to be able to sit down with Mr. Chamberlain uh, and coordinate when that sewage gets turned over to the town, that we're going to have an opportunity to go into it and come back and then come back up to our property. There's also a street, there's also poles on our side of the roadway for electrical connection here. So the whole thing, of course, would be underground electric. Uh, we get back to the subdivision. Um, we talk about sidewalks. Uh, we know that the requirements to have sidewalks on both sides of the street. Jay's been great and offering me great guidance and, and um, um, what might be acceptable and what might not be. Uh, obviously, as the, as the subdivision gets busy down here, there'll be sidewalks on both sides of the roadway to this 50-foot right-of-way. Maybe there's a possibility of just doing one sidewalk further up on this side. Obviously, that's open for discussion. Uh, maybe single sidewalks on Gordon Way or Thurston Lane. Um, but again, that's open for discussion. Um, we talked about um, that the 50-foot turnarounds couldn't be used for frontage. That kind of affected this lot, lot 7. So when next time we're back in front of the board, that will change. Uh, we'll make sure that we comply uh, and we don't have 50-foot turnarounds being used for frontage. Um, landscape architect will be hired as we get further along with this for our entranceway. Some of the thought about having these open space areas Maybe there's a possibility of deeding some of that land to Foley on Lucky Lane and to Doman on Lucky, on Lucky Lane also, giving them the rough amount of frontage that they would require so they're no longer not conforming and they go back to a, they go to a conforming state. Um, street trees, every 50 to 100 feet along the whole roadway, that would be something that would be part of the architects, uh, landscape architects plan. In this open space area right here, this is a field that's mostly dry in the summer. We talked about community gardens, playgrounds. I said in my present, I said in my overview when I submitted my plan three weeks ago that we would meet with the DEP and have that discussion of the possibility of that. After discovering those wetlands down there, we decided to hold back and get those wetlands properly delineated before I get out there with the DEP to have that discussion with them. Last thing I want is a sidewalk going through the property and not having the wetlands properly delineated. Um, Mark Sensi, the soil scientist, went out there. He, he thought that there was going to be no vernal pools on this property, but obviously he's going to write a more formal letter and get out there from May 1st to May 15th uh, and make that determination whether there's any vernal pools back there. Phillips Brook is back here. We have a 75 foot step back for our property here. Um, we have had two meetings. With the, abutters, with the abutters, with the neighbors. Um, we're looking that when we get time, when it can, as we get further along, it's our intent to provide those neighbors with sewer installation and with underground electrical. Um, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna get to an agreement on that and we're gonna be able to provide them that. <clears throat> There's also consideration of affordable housing. We're giving thought to that and how that's going to apply to the, how that's gonna apply to the overall park project. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions that anybody might have as we get move along with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go to board discussion, we don't always have public comment at this stage in the process, but I think that given the, the sort of unique nature of this property and the number of, and range of abutters and some of the questions that have I been ongoing, um, there's a little bit of history to it. I, I thought I would offer that opportunity for any abutters who wanted to come up and um, make any brief remarks. Um, just ask if you do state your name and keep it to five minutes or less. Uh, so Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. Um, you know, it's interesting. This Paul is the third developer who has actually uh, approached us. Uh, the second one never made it as far as the first. I know you had one other proposal in front of you a couple years ago. Um, so what I would say is I, I think Paul has done a great job in terms of being proactive 
and reaching out to us, hearing what our concerns are. Uh, and as Paul said, we've had a couple of meetings and we're definitely moving towards a place where we can get excited about this uh, and be happy for it. But what I would say, uh, and Jane and Jerry are the only neighbors that are not here, the rest, this is all Lucky Lane, here in the third row. Um, now Jane grew up on this, on this land and the house that I currently live in and that Ted and Gail currently live in, she's got this, you know, wonderful stories of, you know, aunts and uncles and holidays and whatnot. So it's kind of that old thing of, you know, when we first moved in, it was rural farming. It was not VR2. So we have these beautiful fields and, and we realize, um, you know, that what was our view will not always be our view. And so we're, we feel fortunate that there's somebody coming to the table who is willing to have that conversation with us because we recognize that a developer doesn't certainly have to take the neighbors into consideration. So um, the other piece of it is, and if you look on your other maps, you will see that both the Doman's property and my property in particular uh, will significantly benefit, uh, be benefited in the long run. Yes, we're going to lose the beautiful fields, um, which I'm sure Gail would say is not what she wants <laughs> uh, to house views, but we will get our own drive. <coughs> so currently, her, uh, our, our lots are non-conforming, as Paul said, and uh, they have to access their house by driving through my driveway. So getting our own driveways back uh, give us a little bit more privacy. There's a benefit there. We do still have some concerns that we shared with Paul about the existing Lucky Lane uh, and that access where it is now, and what would be required of him in terms of closing that. Uh, we believe it's a huge safety hazard. Pulling out of there can be really difficult as it is, so we would imagine that you would require him to close that, um, but we have ongoing discussions around what that would look like, what that might mean for us. Um, you know, we, we love our little spot in the world, um, and to be honest, it would be great if it never got developed, but we understand we don't have that control. So. Uh, we're happy to work with Mr. Hollis and with all of you to make it a win-win for the town and uh, a neighborhood that works for Scarborough. And as you can imagine, I might have been the one who might have planted a, a seed in his ear about affordable housing included in the project. Um, I think that's, that's something I'm passionate about and I think it's important. So um, thanks for hearing us out. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Susan, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you again since I know you were on the board and we heard yeah. about this property previously. Okay, I'm going to ask a few questions first. Sure. Um, when I look at the present Lucky Lane, okay, and the two I'm houses that are fed from the Lucky Lane, what's down below the farm or what? <coughs> it's a property that is not attached to any kind of access. I'm sorry, Susan. Well, we're going to stand in front of the thing. Okay. Now, take where the proposed... Lucky Lane here? No. Go to where the proposed 27-inch uh, wide right away comes through. Right here? No. Oh. No. Where's Lucky Lane? Right here. Yep. Okay. Follow it up. Okay. Okay. Right there. Yep. Now go down, and there's a building to your left. There's a building no, here. There. What is that? That's the that's Yaguti Jenkins home. That's the Jenkins oh, That's the Jenkins yeah, property. We need, we need you to have the mic, sorry. I apologize. Okay, so it's really hard to see from this how that's all going to feed into the new quote unquote lucky lane. I would be very interested to see that developed more concretely. I, I don't get it. And I'm not asking you to tell me right now because okay. this, is, this is just a review session. Okay. But this does not show me anything about how that's going to benefit the present resident of that particular property. You, you don't want me to respond? No. Okay. I'm sure you will. Thank you. This is just, you know, my opportunity to okay. say, hmm. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the staff comments and just go <coughs> through them. You, you have them, I'm sure. Um, okay. Um, interconnected streets and communal spaces. Uh, I'm having a review criteria. Interconnected streets and communal spaces that establish a village design. Um, I'm not saying that I don't approve of this layout, but this is not your standard village. This is a straight line 
with a little bit of a curve to it. It's got a couple of side streets. So I, the, the, de the, de the devil's going to be in the details for this for me. I would like to make sure that there are sidewalks on both sides of the street, and there are street trees on both sides of the street, and everything that can possibly, the lighting is perfect. You know, I mean, I'm overstating the case. But you're going to have to create a sense of um, village from something that is absolutely not a village. Okay? And I think you understand that. Um, okay, where am I? Um, okay, the, the, the part that's going to be the most difficult, I think, is going to be the alignment com coming in off Route 1. I, I, I just don't see how that's going to be resolved, but I don't think that it's my job to try to help anybody figure out how to do that. So. Bill Bray, traffic engineer. Mm -hmm. We're going to hire. Mm -hmm. Bill Bray, and I walked this walked the frontage. Yep. You determined that was the best spot for the access in, was where that easement is and where that road is. So, but of course, Bill Bray's traffic study is going to back that up. Um, Jay, help me. Where is the thing about the right of way having to be um, given to the town? So, well, let's see. There's. <coughs> The right of way doesn't necessarily have to be given to the town. If he wants a private way, that would be one thing. Right. But it generally, so if he wants it to be a if he street wants street to be a town road, the, town road. the issue is, and as uh, Mr. Hollis explained earlier, he's only has about uh, another 24 feet of frontage that he actually owns, and another 26. 27. Yep. So, so the easement, the issue is for the town to accept the road as a public road, we need to have the fee ownership and not just an easement over that. So that would be part of an ongoing discussion. So we could still do a private way because, um, you know, he, he has provided the documentation that the easement exists, but it would uh, maintain as a private way. Like going forward, when you can start to see the connections that this property has with the other properties. Um, it certainly seems to m make sense and merit every effort to push towards a public road. Public road. Um, okay, that's very helpful. I really appreciated what you were saying about maybe needing to come back for another sketch plan. Oh, yes. And I think, oh, yes, is definitely the answer. Just when you said that you think you may have found some additional wetlands, that, yeah. that alone would make a difference. I, I almost thought of pulling myself off the agenda, Susan, but I wanted to get comments. Oh, no. We like having back. you here. <laughs> um, I, I like being here. I know. <laughs> uh, but, but that also will give us time to talk more uh, specifically about this whole thing about is it going to be private or is it going to be public and how 20 houses on a dead end residential street and you've got 34 and how is that all going to work itself out seems to me to be, you know, really mucky. And we can't, the board can't discern. We, we've got to be given a plan that says this is how it's going to be, <coughs> how many houses it's going to be. You're and it seems to me that that's very much up in the air right now. Right. Okay. Good. The hammerhead thing is part of the same, same deal. You've got some of the funniest arrangements of how you're going to get into some of these lots. I just actually started to giggle. It's like, how am I going to get a car in there? The hammerhead thing is really confusing. And that's another thing that I think that you're going to be able to work on if you take a little more time. Uh, the design of the lots at the end of Thurston and Gordon and Lucky Lane need to be reconsidered. You know, I mean, it's all part of the same overall concern that you have. Um, okay, the whole idea of the design standards for the streets. I'm not going to re re reiterate them because they're here in the um, staff comments, but they're all very important, obviously. And then the other elements. I'm very concerned about the um, impaired streams that you are building around, and that's one of the reasons why this has not really gone any further than it's gone in the past, because this is this is tricky. It's really tricky. You, you mean specifically Phillips Brook? Uh, Phillips Brook? Yeah, Phillips Brook. Right. Enhanced buffer of the stream should be considered for the project given that one factor contributing to the impairment of Phillips Brook is concentrated points of stormwater. So already we're talking about a really sophisticated stormwater plan. We have another member of our um, board here who is really big on stormwater management and I'm sure we'll be watching. I agree. Like a hawk. Um, 
layout of development that mimics the natural hydrology of the site. You know, I mean, again, this isn't my cup of tea. I mean, it's, I, I appreciate it, but it's not the thing that I'm really knowledgeable about. But I think that the last one here is the one I'm most concerned about. Extensive changes to wetland areas will impact the overall stream, and therefore, a peer review of the wetland stream location early pool analysis is recommended. And I'm, from what you've said, I'm sure that you're on board with how important that is. Absolutely. Okay, so my overall, my overall um, theory is that if you come up, if you actually do everything you say you want to do, this could go. This Thank could you. go. It really could. I'm going to work hard to uh, embrace everything. We, we are, I, I'm not convinced. I'll be very honest with you. I'm not convinced, but okay. I'm willing to be convinced. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This is Roger. Uh, <coughs> thanks. Um, I actually think this is a pretty interesting concept you have here, um, and I'm glad you've spoken with the abutters uh, because um, I think this Phillips Brook thing uh, is a real dilemma for any future development right. on the other side, the turnpike side of that. Right. Uh, have you spoken to uh, Elliot Chamberlain about? I've had one meeting with him. Okay. And how about? Um, let's see. Is it Gaza? Gaza? Agazarian. Okay, have you spoken to I've him? I've reached out to him. He hasn't been trying to call him. I spoke to his nephew. Mm -hmm. had a meeting with his nephew about the possibility of um, future development on that property. And a price was given to me. And then a few days later, Mr. Agazarian changed his mind. Said he didn't think he wanted to sell it. So, hold oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. um, it up. Okay. Um, just clarified for me on Route 1. The easement is that this way you're talking about the easement, right? Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at this here, all right, is the easement that portion? See where it says 80? Yeah, I'm gonna try to zoom right in on it here for you. It'll be up on the screen. So, well, the big plan. <laughs> Just keep going, right? Yep. Yep. So, yep. Right where it the says 80. Line. That little triangle. So that's, that's the easement area. That's the easement. Right. Right, and I wish my mouse was <laughs> okay. had any color. Uh, honestly, there's a thing in there, but I can't see it. You want me to point to it? Get up and point to it. No, no. I, think no, I mean, that's clear. I think he's got it. You sure? So there's no, there's no problem with that if that goes through. It's, if it, right, it would, if it stays as an easement, then it would be a private. The road would have to remain a private way until. Okay, but if it's sold. If he, if he, if uh, Mr. He Hollis it. gets full ownership <coughs> of it, then it wouldn't be. Then, right, he would My have a full to fifty foot wide right away. And how do how does um, the chestnuts feel about that? Well, but <laughs> they were away on vacation. Oh. We had to, we had a new they came. They just got back, so they couldn't hear the They'll come for a time. We had. Um, Minimum discussion about it, but the probability of me bringing oh, oh, um, water and sewer all the way up to their property, to the back, and giving them access to the back of their property, you would think would by product in some consideration. Sure, okay. Um, <coughs> I, I did note on, um, on this other piece of material here, documentation, that the speed limit rate in that area is 35 miles an hour. Right. Is they go faster though. Is that posted? Do you happen to know whether that's posted both at the north end and the south? You know, when you're coming into Scarborough, is it posted 35? Okay. Um, is that the same speed limit all the way up 35? Or that it, it reduces down to 30. That's the idea. No, it reduces down to 30, I think. Uh, it, it may further up. I, I, I don't know exactly where the transition would be. Okay. Roger, the. Um, as we know, the ordinance is 300 feet away from roadway to roadway. Yeah. We got about 225 feet from the center of Queens Drive to the center of our proposed right away. When I got when I got Bill Bray out there immediately to look at that, I said, you know, I can get 300 feet, but I got to get closer to the existing Lucky Lane, which nobody likes. And he confirmed what? that. Well, they all have the road. The name. The name. The, the name. The, but that is not Bill Bray's. Um, um, uh, professional opinion, that's not the right place to put these access. This is the, this is the place. So, okay. obviously, I'm going to hire you to do a full traffic study to determine that. Um, 
finally, I guess, what's going to happen to the current Lucky Lane? It's it's about, it's, it's, it's the intent is to close the existing Lucky Lane, right. and who's this is going to be the new Lucky Lane. Who's going to take over ownership of that? Of, of this, well, it's either going to be owned by the association or owned by the town, okay. one or the other. Can I make a comment? Okay. No, sorry. Sorry. We're, we're done with public comment. Okay. Yeah. Well, there will be other opportunities. Thanks. Um, I, I guess I guess I'm uh, I'm done, but I I commend you for being so proactive, and you seem to be wanting to get everybody's cooperation. Well, so I without the neighbors, I really can't get this project done. Timing is everything. I respect that, so I'm going to need the neighbors to put this project together. Yeah. Okay, right. Roger. Yeah, I'm all okay. Thanks, Robin. Um. Yeah. As as Roger and Susan said. Um, I commend you for your proactive nature on this. Thank you. And um, I also really commend you for going back out last weekend and seeing that additional wet area. And um, thank you for looking for vernal pools. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, it, that'll be something I think to be seen. However, um, because these are the headwaters of, the, of Phillips Brook, and I'm sure that Angela and other staff members have talked to you about the need to maintain the certain hydrology that's there. Otherwise, downstream properties are going to feel the effects. We know it's vital. Okay. If we have to move lots or eliminate lots, we're open to. I think. I think what's important too is to try to, to the maximum extent possible or practical is to try to keep and treat the stormwater on site. So instead of trying to make it go to one massive stormwater detention pond or have it, you know, go here, there, or everywhere, really think about using a landscape architect and trying to put some type of rain gardens or, in, you know, integrate those types of things. You mean on the character. pretty much where we have this area right here? Mm-hmm. Well, isn't that where you said the map wetlands were, though? It, it, it is a map wetland, but we're a little confused by it because it's pretty dry in the summer. Well, we but also we had a very dry. We were in drought last year too. Okay. So, have you yeah. seen it prior to last year? No. Okay. So let's not use last year as a baseline. Okay. And, and I I don't mean that in a you know a, no, a punitive sense. No, that's what I was told, but I haven't yeah. seen it myself. Yeah. yeah. So really, you know, the whole, if you work with a landscape architect or if you look into these low impact development uh, type of um, techniques and principles, it's really going to give you, it's really going to go a long way, Paul. Okay. And, um, I want to write this down. Okay. <laughs> and I think you've done a good job, too, of trying to minimize your wetland impacts already, but, but definitely low impact development techniques and principles maintaining as much storm water on site as possible right and not putting it to a large centralized like stormwater pond or something like that that's just going to go and rush into the stream and cause flooding downstream kind of thing or or not cause but contribute what if there was a pond area back off the property i mean what if we we know this is the low spot to the property Mm -hmm. right Charles, here. could you grab the handheld again? I'm sorry. That's quite okay. We know this is the low spot right about here. Right. right. And I think that's the area we got to give the most attention to. And well, and what I'm saying is give each parcel its own attention. <coughs> so break it up. Yep. Okay. Exactly. All right. Okay. Um, other things I guess I would be looking for is um, how are you going to minimize the impact when the road crossing? near that wetland, what's considered a wetland mountain area kind of thing. I think we're definitely going to be in a tier one. Okay. I mean, they suggested that, you know, this is only, we get the sound that's 4,000 square feet, but now that we get this, we discovered yep. this wetland down here, yeah. that's all been thrown off the window. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be in a tier one and we're going to have to deal with it. Um, that's, that's about all I had and, you know, continue to review staff as a resource and, and again, think about each parcel on its own and not the larger, okay? Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks, Robin. <coughs> Rachel? Yeah, um, I, as I listened to you, it helped me uh, understand, I was not clear on these right-of-ways and what you were planning on doing, but uh, I think through your discussion, now it 
I, I think you've set up a kind of a win-win for the for the abutters uh, and for the development by allowing them to essentially gain a conforming lot uh, and I was concerned originally that all of a sudden there were going to be two exits, the old Lucky Lane and the, the new Lucky Lane onto Route 1. And so you've, you've cleared up some confusion there. Um, that said, I'm still concerned about uh, the traffic problems on Route 1. Um, we've noted the, uh, the posted speed limits, and I've traveled that, and I've, I've sometimes been the only car that's been traveling the posted speed limit. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it's going to be something that the, the whole town, I think, is going to have to tackle along that area because this question arose when we were looking at Dunstan Corners as well. Uh, the exit onto Route 1, the traffic, the, um, the speed limits. So we, we do have that problem just sitting there. It's not necessarily much you can do about it, but there it is. Uh, along with Susan, I'm concerned about um, we're supposed to see a concept that really creates a village space, and it's not it's not quite here. Oh, I know it's not. Uh, so um, I would really like to see that the That's next time. Point. Yeah, uh, and I also have a question. I know you have the open space um, going all the way back to the. To uh, 95, mm -hmm. and that open space really is where the Phillips Brook crosses, and the watershed, the real watershed area is right here. Phillips Brook. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would, I gather at this point there is no cons there is no further plans to develop past the no. end of this, and in the future is that circling to do with this the back of your mind yeah. uh, that, that that might be a possibility at all. None. To okay. develop the back? Yeah. None. Okay. Um, that's that's some comfort then. Uh, it's interesting that when I first looked at it, I said, "What in the world is he trying to do here?" Uh, but listening to you and, and the staff comments, uh, it's very helpful, and I I do think there's some good possibilities here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Rick. Sure. Um, I have a couple of questions. So. I guess I just, you have no plans to develop that, and I'm not sure if it, um, it's a big parcel of land, so I think that you might want to think about it um, at some point, but is there any way that, that you could put a future restriction, Jay, on developing like a piece of another part of the land, just, just so you know? We are going to restrict it. You are? Absolutely. Okay. And, and, I, and I wasn't actually looking for a restriction as much as if you said I was only going to develop 25% of that. Mm. Like that. Don't if you're willing, that's great. We don't want you know, if the brook wasn't so sensitive, it would be nice to have trails and other things like that. But right. crossing that brook, I don't want to okay. chance it. All right. well, if you put restrictions on things, people don't read them, they don't change. Before you know it, you've got a problem. So right. we'd rather just keep it in its natural straight and <coughs> natural, uh, uh, the natural 11, 12 acre piece and leave it there. Okay. And restrict it. Yeah, um, I looked at this piece of property once. Oh. I looked at uh, your house too with the radium floors. That big one, yeah. That one's got radium. The one in the back. Mm -hmm. That was a nice little house. The thing I liked most about it though was that there was a big field out back mm -hmm. with the hay. <laughs> so I can understand. And my wife stood <coughs> in the backyard and said, that's not always going to be hay. So. Anyway, sorry, sorry. I'm there for a minute. But, oh. um, the other question I had, a couple <coughs> questions, just because I'm a little bit familiar with the plot. There's a little yellow strip through that chestnut land, and over here. Yeah, so right there. Oh, okay. And at one time, I was told by a realtor, and and not that that's always um, all the facts that you need, but. At one time, I was told you could come off, potentially come off a Queens Road, go across that field and into that parcel. That's probably not anything that you looked at, or not anything that. Well, there's a, you know, there's a deeded 50 foot right of way to the came from two canes from the family of Chestnut going down here. 
And um, if somebody wanted to connect to these other properties, that's why that was put there. The 50-foot right away. I'm offering, I'm obviously giving him the connection, as well as the sewer stuff, I might add, at the end of this connection, uh, in case he ever decides to do anything with his back property. But when you start to get back here, as we discovered in looking at the Agazarian property, and it's just a, there's a lot of clay back here. This starts to become, you know, you start dealing with these heavy clays and you're talking about builders coming out and building houses over there. They've got to know what they're building on. They've got to know what they got there for soils. I can't just come in as a responsible land developer and say, oh, okay, yeah, buy a lot and meet the zoning. You've got to know what those materials are back there because when it comes to putting basements in, where's water going to go? Where's water going to go? So I, not only do I have to think beyond my stormwater plans for my roadway, I have to think of stormwater for every one of those houses. And where's that water going to go? Right. And when I get my stormwater guy um, on this, I've asked the two engineers I'm interviewing about this. I mean, that stormwater is a big part of this whole thing. Right. And it's going to be taken right to the construction of the homes, not just the construction of the roadway. Right. The reason, part of the reason I asked about that right away was because um, when I looked at the house that's existing on that piece of property, or the property in front of your proposed subdivision, uh, coming in and out on Route 1, that's around a corner and down a hill. Mm. So making a right is, you know, feasible. Making a left is borderline suicide, I would say. But um, maybe we could get creative with the signage. I know on Holmes Road where it crosses Beach Ridge, I think, they've got the blinking red stop signs, Angela. The, I love those. <laughs> yeah. It's the only one my kid stops for. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if like the blinking 35 mile an hour signs m might be something that we could talk about. I think that'd be great. Just, yeah, to, just to keep your people safe. I know that's yeah. something that you want. Um, I do really need to see what Bill Bray has to say. Yeah, might be one of his ideas. Site. He's a pretty smart Before guy. I get too uh, right. further along with it. I do like your short driveways. Um, <coughs> last winter, but I am a little that dead end, the very dead end down here. Yeah, yeah. how are we how are we turning around down there? I mean, is that is, are we backing into someone's driveway and turning them around? Well, you know, I think they have this dedicated as a fire channel, mm -hmm. but this whole Rick, this whole area back here, considering the closeness with the with um, Phillips Brook and how we handle the stormwater down here. And of course, um, Robin's suggestions about breaking things up. I think this is going to get adjusted and changed a little okay. back here. I mean, the fire department. I mean, we could provide the fire department an easement to get them here and turn around. Uh, but I think we've got to be a little bit more sophisticated when we get back. To yeah, like that. I would. You know, I know this is just a preliminary plan, and I like your plan. I just think that you might want to think about that. Just right. To, to I forever have people turning around in my driveway. So, um, yeah, the rest <coughs> of it, the rest of it, looks good. I, I like the fact that you reached out to the neighbors. That was very nice of you, and um, I think that promotes goodwill. I think we got to turn it into a village, though. Yeah, that's all. I think it's fine. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, we've done a pretty good job collectively here of kind of setting the table and laying out the, the parameters in terms of what some of the opportunities and challenges are here. Um, uh, as stated uh, earlier, I don't think we need to get too far into the weeds on some of the nuances of the no lot layouts and things like that. And we've, we've got a lot to sort of figure out um, with some built-in constraints here. Um, I do agree and will amplify that, as you just stated, you need to look at how you can create a little bit more of a village feel in terms of your street network and block configurations and so forth within the context of um, some, some uh, environmental sensitivities as has been noted. Um, I really appreciate your diligence on, on the, the wetlands and delineating that, redelineating that, um, and your, your what seems to be genuine uh, sensitivity to all that. Um, likewise, uh, regarding the, the the neighbors and the abutters, and I would say to the, the neighbors that, um, as I mentioned earlier, this you know there will be other opportunities, and I would also encourage you to I probably don't need the encouragement, but continue to obviously communicate directly with the developer as well. Um, 
you know, we, the board can be, board and staff can be something of an intermediary at times. Okay. Sometimes it's most They keep a pretty short leash on me, Mr. Right. Chairman, so. So if there's, a, if there's a direct line of communication, that's great. Um, and then we do have built into our process as we move into more of a full site plan review and get beyond sketch that there is another opportunity for public comment at that point. And you can also correspond by email and so forth. Um, so I think that's all good and encouraging. Uh, we've got kind of a laundry list of to-do items here, which uh, I, won't, I won't list all out, but I trust you have all that. Um, from tonight and it's in the staff comments. Um, we'll obviously look forward to seeing the traffic analysis. That's the, that's the, you know, one of the big questions certainly and I think there, as this was alluded to, there's a kind of a bigger issue here that transcends this proposal around speeds and what the town and others may be able to do to address that situation. Mm -hmm. And we just, within the context of this project, want to make sure that we don't make anything worse and that um, we can figure things as safely as possible if this does go forward. Um, one of the housekeeping items that Jay mentioned um, just in the staff notes is on the, on the, on the address and, and again I'm sure you, you have all that noted down. Um, I'm just going to make sure we're not missing anything here. I think we've covered everything. I am, I am glad to hear that you're considering incorporating some sort of affordable housing and that's been as you know I'm sure been sort of an evolving um, process here and, and outlook here in terms of how, what the town can do to kind of incentivize those things. So I really hope you'll, you'll, you'll drill down on that and be able to incorporate something. Um, one thing I did want to propose, given the nature of this, this property and, and what's being proposed, um, which we've done on several other projects, is that we work with staff to schedule a site <coughs> off to the board. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that to staff to coordinate with the, with the developer and, and certainly the, the, the abutters will be kept in the loop as well. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we are, you know, we're, we're in the spring and um, snow's gone, we can get a good feel for, for how things set up and, and how things relate to each other because sometimes it's hard to get your head around it just looking at plans. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, again, I think that's a really good start to the sketch process and hopefully you'll be able to build on that. I plan on coming in with a better plan. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, members. <coughs> the next item, KGN Properties LLC requests a sketch plan review for a daycare facility at 79 County Road, Assessor's Map, okay. R15, Lot 78. You're next. Introduce this one, Jay. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is for a commercial development in, in our TBC2 district for a daycare facility out at the corner of County and Sokka Road. Um, I think it's a couple of things that are worth noting on the property. One, it's in the Aquifer Protection Overlay District, which has some uh, requirements in terms of stormwater design and, and other type of elements. Then the other provision that uh, is particularly worthy of note is that this property is listed on our historic preservation um, list in the zoning ordinance. And so there's a set of criteria there for the planning board to work with the applicant on in terms of uh, preserving the property to essentially the greatest extent possible. And I'm sure um, board members have looked at the, the sort of uh, site plan revit uh, standards around, around that. So. I think that's something we'll want to uh, spend a bit of time here at Sketch Plan talking about. And, and to that end, uh, given that this property is on this is on the list, um, staff did uh, convene or, or pull together the uh, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee, and the applicant um, sat down together probably about a month or so ago to start to talk about the property and to review sort of the historic elements uh, therein. And so I'm, I'm sure the applicant sort of prepared to talk a little bit about that meeting um, and probably worth the discussion just, uh, you know, at this point staff would anticipate that when a formal submission is uh, brought forth that we'd send that back to the historic folks for a review and, and their recommendations and uh, unless they hear otherwise from the board that would be our expectation. Uh, I think the other critical element to talk about on this project is traffic. Um, 
Sasco and County Roads, that intersection is uh, is pretty notable in town for uh, for not the right reasons. Um, so I, we just want to be sure the applicant is aware of that fact and be sure I, it, they mentioned that they have a traffic engineer sort of uh, queued up and that they do a full um, analysis of the area and intersection and um, you know just ensure that this development doesn't uh, exacerbate existing issues and where feasible make improvements. Um, then we have a couple other elements that we flagged just in terms of architecture. I, think, um, I should note that uh, I had an opportunity to meet with the applicant, I think twice even outside of the Historic Preservation Commission meeting to really talk about sort of building location, trying to orient the building close to the corner as our design standards typically call for in the, in the zoning see talk about access management where they have furniture on both County and Saco Road really limiting access to sort of the, the street with the lesser uh, traffic, um, through traffic anyway. So um, a lot of those sorts of elements, uh, you know, the applicant's been pretty responsive of and we've had <coughs> the conversations around. And I guess with that, that's our effect you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, members of the Planning Board. My name is Vinyl Appleby. I'm a licensed uh, professional engineer working for the Sheridan Corporation. And uh, we're, we're pleased to be here this evening to uh, present this sketch plan. Uh, joining me tonight, the two folks here on my right, is uh, the lady is uh, Katie Norton, and she is the owner and applicant. And so she's the uh, uh, applicant, KGN Properties, uh, LLC. And Jim Anderson is also from uh, Sheridan Corporation. Uh, they have got some information they'd like to share with the board at the end of my presentation, if that's possible, or to address uh, the historical preservation uh, concerns that Jay has brought up and, uh, and also the building issues that Jay has brought up. Uh, I, I did want to say before I get started, I always appreciate uh, Jay's time. As you mentioned, we've met twice already with him. He's been great uh, guiding me through this process so far. Being third on the agenda, I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've learned. <laughs> So, pictures uh, tell a thousand words, and um, start with a couple of aerial photographs actually taken off Google. Um, the property is a 3.68 acre parcel located, uh, as identified earlier, uh, at the intersection of um, County Road, Route 139, and Saco Street, um, and we're in the northeast quarter. Currently on the property, uh, which is outlined, the shape of which is outlined by this red line. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, fairly, fairly, almost a square parcel. Uh, we've got fields, we've got um, treed areas, and um, a previous residential structure, and a three or four outbuildings on the property. <coughs> Wanted to do, uh, also show the, so this is, diagonally across, looking back towards our property to the northeast, and oh, if we were to uh, stand or fly or whatever, position ourselves over the uh, property and look back in the southwest direction, um, I, I, I thought this would be an important photograph because I'm not sure who, how many times the board members have been at this intersection, uh, but these, I wanted to highlight the other three corners, just uh, as a frame of reference as to what we're proposing and what the neighborhood, I call it the neighborhood. I mean, I know that uh, Scalboro is very diverse. We have lots of different types of neighborhoods in the, in the town, and uh, this is uh, this is our immediate neighborhood. So we're in the uh, PVC2 district zone, and this property, uh, besides that zone um, ordinance and requirements uh, that we have that we fall under, we are um, also fall under a sand and gravel aquifer overlay district, which brings a certain, as you know, a certain um, amount of criteria with it. And I'd like to uh, address some of those as, as I continue with the presentation. What we have here is a, a lot of photographs, um, which I've included these photographs in the uh, um, sketch plan material that I submitted in the application. Um, basically, this shows it's a fairly open parcel uh, with trees and outbuildings, as mentioned. Got a couple of photographs here as well of the uh, previous resident structure. 
thought we might get into that and discuss those a little, discuss that a little bit more. So moving right along, um, we're looking at a site plan that may look like this. Uh, the name of the project's Laughing Out Loud Child Care Center. Um, I, I want to mention the, the, a little more about the property itself. There's, it is really a basically flat piece of property. There's only about a two to three feet topography difference between the front and the rear. Um, because of that, there's basically no stormwater runoff in the existing condition. So we were challenged with that, um, thinking ahead as to the stormwater runoff uh, in the developed condition. We have no, uh, besides being in the, in the stormwater, I mean in the uh, sand and gravel uh, aquifer all the way district, uh, we have no um, natural features such as uh, water bodies or wetlands or uh, streams. It's, we've done some test pits in uh, preparation of on-site septic because also uh, as the other properties that we heard, this is, uh, there's no public water and sewer available to this property. So we'll all be, um, those two water and sewer will be on site. Um, so we did some uh, test pits in, pre in uh, preparation for septic design and we've got 10, we went down 10 feet or so in 10 different locations and it's all sand. So that's good and it's bad. It's great for septic design, it's great for stormwater uh, infiltration, but because uh, basically everything, all the stormwater now runs directly in, down into the ground, again, we're challenged with that in the uh, developed condition. So uh, as mentioned, we have engaged uh, Diane Larabito from Maine Traffic Resources, who has uh, done some preliminary work um, and uh, pending this meeting. She's prepared to finish up her traffic study, but what she's identified so far, she's done, they've gone out and done traffic counts in this area, and certainly they, I think they're very uh, familiar with the issues that the town sees at that intersection. First and foremost, and readily, um, readily uh, noticeable is, okay, where are we going to have our access to the site? As you see, as we're proposing, we are coming off the side road, Saco Street, and just as far away from the intersection as we can. We can't do any better job than that right there. Um, we will have a fair amount of, a uh, fair number of peak hour trips, which happen to coincide with, uh, with peak hour in the roadways because we are looking at uh, children being dropped off pretty much, you know, rush hour in the morning and being picked up in, in the late afternoon or uh, early evening rush hours. So, um, We've got a configuration and egress went single lane in and uh, it's been identified that it would be very helpful to have a right out and a left out as well. Just to keep track of movement absolutely as much as possible um, egressing from our property. We've got um, properties 5,000 square foot which is maximum allowed zone. Um, we're looking at the building of, of 5,000 square feet. So it would be a playground area fenced in playground area for uh, safety and security. Um, we uh, are looking at these three areas here are uh, bioretention ponds that we're looking at doing uh, some treatment. That's uh, one of the requirements of being in the sand and gravel um, overlay district is that we have to address as if it was a DEP stormwater um, project, we have to address the quality as well as quantity. So quality wise, we have broken up the proposed drainage areas into three smaller areas. Each one of those would be addressed by these bioretention ponds. We've engaged a professional landscape architect who's looking at properly um, uh, pro the proper plantings that would go in bioretention, as well as completely, of course, uh, around the site as required. The uh, Stormwater, we're not looking at one large detention pond, uh, essentially because uh, generally with a detention pond design, you have an outlet and the water goes somewhere eventually. Well, again, we're, we, uh, we, can't, we don't have anything running off site now, so we uh, can't, we have to meet that condition in the proposed situation. So we are looking at uh, underground chambers, basically the stormwater after it runs off the site through the bioretention ponds 
will end up in underground chambers and 100% will be infiltrated back into the ground as the, um, pre as the, ex the existing condition. Um, we've identified an area, potential area for the on-site well and septic in this area. We're in the sand and gravel aquifer, you've heard me say that. Um, we also have to do a nitrate study. Actually, we've had that done already and things are looking really, really good as far as meeting the criteria in the ordinances for uh, nitrate levels at the property line. We're, we're far below that. I think um, I'd like to address the staff's comments in reverse order, if that's possible. Starting with the uh, second page. Did I do it in the glasses? So staff has, uh, mentioned, has noticed uh, or recorded in item G that it appears that the disturbance is greater than an acre, um, which is in fact uh, correct. So we will have to do a um, DEP stormwater uh, permit, but only a permit by rule, because the actual amount of impervious as proposed is less than an acre. I think we're still going to be subject to the provisions of the town's post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance, as uh, Jay has mentioned. The parking ratio is F, moving towards the uh, beginning of these comments. We've, we're showing 32, so we were pretty close. I guess calculations by staff is 33. We'll make sure we have 33. The uh, dumpster pad location differed from what uh, presented in your package uh, between the site plan and the landscape plan. And, uh, you know, this being sketch plan, we're in, the, we're in the process of revising the site plan. I can tell you now that the uh, dumpster location, our preferred location is shown as shown on, I don't remember which plan, but it would be this plan here, closer to the roadway which I know might be staff's uh, less, uh, less preferred location, but we will uh, ensure that we will uh, fence that dumpster in with a adequately high fence and lots of landscaping. The reason I had it one time on one plan, and I think that's the one that was being referred to, we had it at, um, in another location, but it was adjacent to the playground area, and, and we had some concerns about that, not only from smell, but the very remote chance that, you know, we have a dumpster fire or something like that. We really didn't want that next to, it does happen, I mean, rarely, rarely, um, but we, we didn't want any kind of uh, possibility like that right next to where the children will be outside playing. So we'll, we'll take care of it with adequate landscape and we'll probably end up um, in the location we show now, unless we hear from the board with strong suggestions. Um, so D is just locate, uh, screening the propane, the, uh, propane tanks, which we will. Um, C mentions that there's a possibility uh, uh, that we might be able to reduce the amount of impervious through a redesign of, of I guess mostly probably the secondary exit. I didn't mention that. Right. The main circulation would be traffic in here, parking here, and exiting <coughs> back in this direction. Okay, but now we're, we anticipate that a number of children will be dropped off by a bus, a small bus. <coughs> a bus can't turn around in this parking lot, so we're looking at the circulation for a bus, basically making this loop and coming around here. There may be an opportunity for us to shorten this area here back in back and bring it back into this exit. Um, maybe take these parking spaces and extend it up here a little bit. And then in that case, this would only solely be a bus exit versus some additional parking. I was looking at that as employee parking. But that so if uh, if any members have comments on that, I'd like to hear them. Uh, B, moving up to the top of page two, 
Oh, it was identified that in this area and in the future there may be sidewalks in this area. There's adequate right-of-way on both County Road and Saco Street for the most part for a sidewalk within the town right-of-way. That's not the case right here in the corner. The property line is almost at the pavement in this corner. So what we're proposing to do to address this concern is that we will provide a diagonal, for lack of a better description here, a diagonal easement. We'd like to propose that to the town, have it available to the town, at which point if and when the sidewalk is constructed that we'll be able to utilize that corner of the property for sidewalk construction. So if I could just jump up to traffic concerns next on the first page and save the architectural and the historic for Katie and Jim. The traffic as identified, yes. So this intersection gets pretty bad. It depends on what time of day you're there, obviously. So we feel that Main Traffic Resources understands the issues going on at that intersection. I think they have a real good handle at the traffic that we're generating, and I believe they've made some early comments, and I included those that they're not anticipating a significant difference. There will be some movements that will change in their level of service. I saw some early numbers that some one or two movements actually got better. That's to be seen in the traffic study, which I know will be reviewed by peer review, I'm sure. So we'll include a full traffic study as part of our formal submission. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to perhaps Jim first on the architectural. My name is Jim Anderson. I'm with Sheridan Corporation, and I've been working in conjunction with the owner, and also we've hired an architect on the design standards, and what we've tried to do is to incorporate what Scarborough has offered in the specific design standards. We'll look at the exterior first. And more specifically, because it is a corner lot, it requires more architectural detail on both Salco Street and along Route 22. So what we've tried to do is to incorporate those standards and what the owner feels is the desired look for the schoolhouse with a vinyl siding similar to a clapboard siding, steep pitch roof, adding an accent for the main entrance to the building with some brick veneers, and then also along. So this is the main entrance. This actually faces a parking lot. So really because of the building location and how it's situated on the lot, all four facades of the building will have a great deal of architectural detail. So in this end here is the narrow end of the building, and this faces Route 22. And these doors are accessed out of the school classrooms, and again will have a porch along this entire end wall with a sidewalk to allow access out of the classrooms in the event of an emergency out of the parking lot. And then this elevation on the top of the page, this is the side of the building that will face Salco Street. And what we've done is incorporated a few false doors along the roof line, and we're showing a cupola, but that's just, I think we're going to get away from that design. I think we may end up with some other detail to help break up this long roof line here as well. And I know we're just in the sketch plan phase, but we figured if we could give you as much information as possible tonight, it helps us in the next meeting and also gives you a better idea of what we're trying to accomplish here. So the look and feel of the building, we're trying again to incorporate what the town requires and also the owner's requirements. 
and also keep the, keep the construction costs in, on, on an affordable level. Um, and we have a rough floor plan that we've developed so far. Um, I don't know how much we need to get into this tonight, but that's, this is all based upon the design criteria for, um, for daycares and the number of children in the school. And that's all based upon um, uh, what the current state and federal code requires. Um, so really that's what I've got for the architectural details. Again, any input you have uh, tonight would be great. See if we're headed down the right, the right path uh, in regards to what you folks are expecting. Uh, will be very appreciated. Um, so what I will have Katie discuss the uh, historical issue on the house and site. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Norton, um, owner of uh, this property. And um, it was brought to our attention after we purchased the property that it was on the um, historical uh, list. And so um, thanks to Jay, uh, I got in touch with the Historic Preservation Implementation um, Committee and we um, met and kind of discussed what it was about this property that they felt was um, historical or of um, archaeological significance. Um, and we came to the determination that it was mostly the house. Um, they were concerned about the house um, being of historical significance given it's um, the old Thames residence, um, one of the last um, sawmills in the state, shingle sawmills in the state, which I believe was moved off the property at some time ago. Um, and so the house was what they really were considering, um, they wanted us to preserve and to keep. Um, and so after that discussion, I went out and I found, uh, I talked about three different people that were maybe interested in moving the house, because that's in the provision as um, something that could be done. Um, one of them being Ryan from Down and Back Salvage, um, the other being uh, Warren and Michael Knight of um, Silent Hill Farm and Hillside Lumber, who I believe have actually moved houses for Scarborough before and have actually preserved them and then I think they're talking about actually giving them one of them back at this point too. Um, and then another is um, a general contractor who um, does salvage work and his name is um, Chris Churchill. So in meeting with these people, um, we've come across um, a number of different things with the home um, and we learned before I met with the historical committee um, that the original house actually burned down in the 1930s. Um, this house is not the original home. Um, it does have the original foundation. The house that's there is thought to be a recreation of the home, the 1700s home um, that was there. Um, in speaking with um, these three groups of people, um, we came up with um, many different things about the home, um, mostly that um, there are some concerns about whether or not this is actually, can, can be considered a replication of the original home. Number one, um, when you go in the basement, there's the original 1700s foundation. The L portion of the home is actually a new granite foundation, so there is actually an addition on the house. Um, the other is um, there is plain milled lumber beams in the attic, um, which can be bought currently at any hardwood store. It was thought that maybe the um, Thames family had rebuilt the house themselves. They owned a circular sawmill, um, and so um, these are plain straight um, mill boards and not circular saw boards like you would find um, if they milled it themselves. Um, also, um, the night um, <coughs> kind of pointed out the big is that big one is that there's there's absolutely no chimneys in the home except for one that fed a wood stove. Um, there's no fireplaces in the home, which there would have been one in every room in the 1700s home. Um, also, there is two-inch hardwood oak in throughout the home on the floors. Um, a 1700s replication would have wide beams of pine boards. Um, and also molding in the home was done um, in bit piece and not as one big cast molding like would have been done in the 1700s. Um, given that, we still wanted to see what we could do um, to preserve the house as much as we could. Um, so we do have a signed um, proposed contract with uh, Chris Churchill um, that if the town planning board allows us, um, he takes things down piece by piece. Um, makes a blueprint and he is willing to rebuild the house um, if an adequate home is found for it. Um, that, you know, looking at the provisions, moving the house off the property is one of the things that the Historical Society um, does consider an adequate form of preservation. Um, so, you know, given the fact of the questionable historical relevance of the home, um, we are still trying to find another home for it, if at all possible. Um, other things that we've looked at in the home, um, of like why the, the nice 
did not want it on their property, um, despite the fact that they actually have a um, relationship with the Tem family. Um, it's a two by four construction, there's no insulation. Um, there's no bathroom in the home, which is what makes it very intriguing to some people. But if this home was to be moved and repurposed and reused, a bathroom would be put in. Um, so therefore taking away from that historical piece of that home. Um, and then also, there is a lot of smoke damage to the inner walls of the home. We don't know if the furnace backfired at some point or if it's from the wood stove. And there's also mold on the walls. So the walls themselves could not actually be taken off, insulation put in, and then the walls put back on. Um, so to redo this home would be a great undertaking. Um, and then to end up with a home that would not still be a replication of the original 1700s home um, seems to be like a little loss of labor there. So um, that's kind of what we found at this point. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, comments about that. Um, but like I said, and I do have copies of the signed um, proposal um, from the contractor who um, said he is willing to try to find a home um, for it, but he would take it down in pieces in the process. That's our presentation. We'd be happy to take questions and love your input. All right, thank you. Um, we'll start down at this end this time. Rick? Um, I have a few questions. I am actually the abutter next to that. As I said, you look incredibly familiar. Yeah. You, you live next to that, this property? I live right next to it, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Get the horses. You, so Get the horses. We, um, we, we spoke with you first looked at it and I thought that uh, daycare would be a great idea. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm glad to see that you're able to do that or <laughs> proposing to do that, I should say. Um, <clears throat> so I have a couple of questions. One is, um, can you flip back to the site plan that shows the, um, <coughs> yeah, that one. Okay. Um, I like the overall layout. I like the playground area um, and the turnaround. The thing that I would mention is I know that they were out there doing a um, stormwater topography map of the site, and it is very flat, as you know. Um, but it does, just from living next door and sitting on the porch, it does run from the front corner to the back corner. Correct. Just a, you know, so when, and I know you're going to be, when you, if you move forward with this, you're going to be grading and leveling and, and putting in parking lot and all that stuff. So I don't know if the, the positioning of those stormwater chambers in the back, how that uh, plays into things, but I would say that once you get all the, you know, as you grade it and get everything laid out where you want it, I would try to put those where they're most effective. There's a little hill actually in that back corner, um, but there, it's kind of like one is right in the lowest spot and one is in the little I bit higher I think this spot. is about the lowest spot right here it from is. the, the topo. We're gonna have, we're gonna have less running off in the developed condition than, than exists. Yeah. Because we're, we're gonna, as you can see, we're gonna, we're, right now we're proposing this to all be, uh, you know, in its natural state. With, we're gonna save as many trees as we can. Um, so there'll just be, instead of this whole lot, what little does run off over here, like I said, that doesn't sink into the ground, right. uh, it will just be this in the future. Uh, what, what this is going to be is underground storage to take care of the volume right. of water coming okay. out here. That's what so. I thought. And then she's, a, she's an expert in storm water, so when we get to her, she will. Yeah. I'm not even, I don't have to, I know right. she's, well, she's going well, next up. Care. She will, she will take care of it fully. <laughs> I learn something new from her every week. Okay. Yeah, we don't have the luxury of the storm weeks. drains even in the street, but we don't have the luxury of uh, tying into those like most sites would because nothing goes there now. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I would just like to see when you when you get it all done, just keep in mind that it's flat as when you, as you're, even if you grade it a little bit, you change it because it's so flat. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, and then the other thing was the septic systems. I kind of like where those are because uh, it's a good spot for those. Um, we want them as far away from you as possible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I asked Jay, I'm, st I'm still part of the planning board. I'm, I have no, nothing to gain from or lose from this, so um, I'd like to give my comments. Um, where the septic systems are, though, you're going to have, like, you potentially could have 100 kids there. I know you said you only could put a license in for 75, but, you know, that's a great spot for a daycare, so you might have some pretty high demand for your services. So I would just, obviously, you'll have the septic design um, designed for that. I'm not concerned about that, but I would want to see it for the maximum number of people, which I'm sure you're going to do. Um, and I guess, guess the other thing is just, you know, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you're in an aquifer overlay area and you have to take all that into consideration when you're, because um, my well is not far from your well, so. Um, other than that, I think I looked at the architecture. I thought it looked really good. I thought it fits the area well because it's kind of a farming kind of, North Scarborough is more of a farming type community, I'll say, agricultural, and it, it, I like it. your uh, design looks really nice. It, I think it fits the area well. And um, I already know like a bunch of people that are probably going to sign up for your daycare. So <laughs> um, I think that's all I have. I'll have to maybe when you come back. Sure. Thank you. So. Thanks. Rich? Yeah, uh, a couple of things. Um, when I first read the description of the building that was on there and the fact that there was no bathroom, uh, it, it took me a bath for a minute and then I realized that what was probably <coughs> close to that facility was a one holer out and back, which would have been what uh, would have been on the land of the 1700s and probably in the 1930s as well. Um, I this may be heresy, but I probably don't have as much of a concern about the preservation of, of that building because it doesn't sound as though it really did replicate the house from the 1700s. But I will say with the, the foundation of half of that house being from the 1700s, uh, I don't know if you've given any thought to the possibility of using that dressed stone, that old stone, as some sort of a feature on the property as a way of at least preserving that part uh, of the heritage. Um, there may be some, you know, some really good possibilities there that, sure. that you could use. Oh, I forgot to mention too. We are very oh, much... You need to come up and back up to the podium. <coughs> we are very much willing to work with the Historical Society if they would like to put some kind of monument plaque or something like that on the land as well. Um, but using the foundation is actually a, an amazing idea. That's yeah. a great idea. Thank you. Yeah. You're going to have to do something with it we could uh, to fill it in or yeah. whatever, but those, those stones might uh, tie the heritage of the land to your, yeah, your building. The I think the landscape great architecture idea. architect would love to, <laughs> love to incorporate that into the plan. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think the architecture uh, looks great. I like that there's interest on every side of the building. As I looked at the inside, I guess the only question I had, I'm not familiar with the uh, requirements um, on ADA bathrooms, and you have one in there. I don't know with 75 children if a second might be warranted someplace. I'm not, again, I'm not familiar with the requirements, but I, I was wondering about that possibility. Um, in each classroom, they'll have their own individual bathrooms. We have an ADA bathroom, and this is for public use mm -hmm. and for the staff, okay. but each classroom will have its own individual bathroom for the students or for the infants. And, and ADA compliant? Yeah, wh whatever is required for the ADA compliance is, is what, what the architect will incorporate into the plans. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you. And one other question on the location of the dumpster. I. It was shown on two different places. Right. Uh, is it going to be where the, the school bus circles around? Are the school bus going to be going past that, or that's on one? Yes, that, that, that was on one gap that we this got. This is our current plan. In this location, we originally had it up here, but then okay. the concerns for being the closeness to the playground were, were an issue. I mean, you know, you gotta uh, give provisions for the truck to come in and pick it up, and then I guess the the uh, the, the uh, solid waste truck would also leave in that area. But that that seems to be about the only um, potential for another area here. If we continue it like this, it's further from the building, but 
But there will be some decent screening. Well, uh, we can screen that. Uh, we can screen it very well. Okay. All right. Thank you. I I like your concept. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, Katie did a great job conveying the historic um, communications with um, the National Historic Implementation Committee. And I guess my question is for staff, Jay, or do we get a summary from, from the committee of that, or were you in the loop on that? So I was at the initial meeting, okay. um, and where, you know, there isn't a formal application to this yep. point. Um, the committee hasn't provided a okay. formal recommendation, but as I sort of yeah. said at the outset, my my inclination would be, and unless the board tells me otherwise, would be when we do receive a formal application, like we do with other peer reviewers, and we've okay. dealt with the conservation commission yep. in the past, and, yep. and others would be to send this directly okay. to the historic committee and ask for their recommendation Great. and input for the board's consideration. And the reason I'm asking is because I tend to agree with my colleague um, to my right here that um, the findings don't find it of real high value, but I completely love the idea of the foundation stone being, um, that's, that's absolutely great. Um, other things um, I noticed, and I really commend you all too for, for um, identifying trees that you can maintain on site as much as possible. Um, I have a little question about a couple of them around the edges of pavement, whether or not they'll be able to save, be saved kind of a thing. But I guess my, my question is in how you going to communicate that to your contractor because I know we all sit here in this room and say we're going to save this one and this one and this one, but till you get out there with your grader and your contractor, it's another story. Yeah. Well, Sheridan Corporation is is the contractor. Great. Okay, um, that's what I wanted we're to We're not the we, we, um, So we've got that extra close okay. bond with our site. Okay. We don't do the site work, but we okay. sub that out. But um, it'll be like a GC. Uh, Jim and I personally okay. will be involved with that. Jim's project manager, and I, I'd be the, the site engineer. Um, we're also looking at as we tweak this design, pushing pushing the pushing the pavement a little more to the east. Mm -hmm. Which will allow, actually we lose a tree that we thought we could yep. save, but it's yep. one of those ones that was really close. Which yeah. so, but but we definitely have uh, a better situation with some trees in this area. Great. So Great. again, we'll do all of these trees over in this area and and along the property line along back here. Those are all to remain. Okay. So we're, we feel like we're doing the best we can. Great. And here they come. The stormwater questions. Um, okay. Um, I know you said that you're going to get a PBR, but um, right. with an infiltration gallery type thing that you have there, right. is, does that lend itself to a PBR? I mean, I just you don't have to answer it now. I'm just wondering, or whether or not you need to have the biofilters lined or anything like that, because you think you got your drinking water well, not too far from where your inf infiltration gallery is, kind of a thing. So I'm thinking. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. I, I, okay. Honestly, I, I don't think we've. Um, turn over every stone with regard to that, so that's, okay. that's good. In, that's good input. Uh, you know, the first inch of rainfall will be treated through okay. here. Um, we're going to put in provisions in the catch basins as well for okay. oil, for oil. I, I was just going to say an oil water separator so, would be perfect. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, the fact that we get 10 plus feet of gravel, yeah. I and mean, everything's going okay. going straight down. But we'll, take, we'll, we'll look at that too. All right, and. Um, Again, just a, just a reminder too, if the bioretention ponds need to be lined or not, I can't remember. Yeah, we'll have a we'll have a full design and a detail in our. Full yeah, design. with the aquifer protection overlay. It's, right. It's uh, I think we're proposing it, it it to be lined. Okay, and um, <laughs> I think I think that's all I had. You guys are well on your way and far further than the sketch plan. I think the concept. So good luck. I can see the excitement. Well, well <laughs> thanks, Roger. Um, I would agree with my colleagues. Um, I, th I think this is a great project for this area, and it's uh, well needed, I, I imagine. Um, I want to talk to you, ask you about the, uh, you mentioned a small bus. You anticipate using a, you know, the, uh, a small bus. Do you still need that radius turn with a small bus? Which, uh, yeah, this one, well, both of those, believe it or not. Well, we're looking at a, if you're familiar with vehicles, I think it's the same as a single unit 40 foot. Um, so it would be a, I guess it would be a small school bus, even though I think it's really going to be a van, a van type bus. 
So uh, yeah, I've got another plan where I, you know, uh, that shows the footprint of the, the wheels going through here, and that much is required. If that's what you're asking here. Well, I was I was wondering if it's going to be a regular size school bus or, a, or just a van, because if it's just a van, then you might be able to just reduce that circle, that, that radius, to eliminate some of the pavement. Right. But if it's going to be a school bus, then. I'll have that we'll, um, we're going to, Katie's going to have a, uh, she'll be the landlord, there'll be another entity actually uh, operating the daycare, and they, uh, I'll get that question answered. Okay. Because they know more what, how the children are going to be dropped off other than by their parents, right? Okay. Um, we'll make it as small as we can. We don't want sure, to put yeah. pavement down that we don't need to. Sure. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to uh, take advantage of the Stone Foundation. I'm just kind of curious, do you have any sense, does the Historic Society consider the building historic? Any? They do? Okay. Um, what, what happens if nobody, the uh, church or can't find somebody to take it? What are you going to do then? Don't own it <laughs> at that point. Okay. He's going to move it off your property, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, Roger, if I just could come back to that point, I mean, that's, I know the, the, the planning board really hasn't dealt with the historic preservation component too much. I think the one project we dealt with was the um, Southgate House, where Vest is doing some multifamily, and they were preserving it, and really there wasn't a whole lot of question came up other than, I think, of the porch was that part of the original. But uh, be that as it may, with this one, um, where the applicant is really not proposing to repurpose the existing <laughs> building and, and has um, at least begun to articulate that it doesn't have usefulness for what she's looking to do. Um, what the ordinance really talks about, and, and I can dig out the precise language, but um, really talks about ensuring that the applicant has given every due diligence to preserve the building, either on site or to relocate the site. Um, but ultimately, it's up for the planning board to sort of decide, you know, what, where does it go? But I do think, you know, again, the historic uh, impl uh, uh, implementation committee, preservation committee, will have, have, you know, their recommendations and thoughts in terms of the site. But um, I just, you know, want to put that out there in terms of, you know, Miss uh, Norton has sort of done what she, you know, thinks she can do with it, and. I do think, you know, if we do look forward to moving forward to a relocation or a removal and rebuild, you know, maybe some further documentation about what that looks like and how that occurred. And I don't know, I don't know what the answer is right now, but, um, you know, just something to... Yeah, and I'll briefly jump about. in to piggyback on that to say that I, I agree with Jay's recommendation mentioned earlier that we, that we have the historic committee provide us with a more formal kind of assessment and memo long lines of what we get from Conservation Commission and so sure. forth. Um, and that, you know, it's also, I also want to make the point that having that committee designate something as significant and, uh, you know, has implications for our process and the ordinance, but it's not the same thing as, as suggesting that it's on a national register or, or a, you know, an official landmark or something like that. That's not at all to say that it's not significant, but that's, I think that's an important distinction to make because the council designates the whole, so, um, so the it, it may be designated by the council, and that has real implications that we need to, that we need to take into consideration. But there are different sort of levels of it, and so I think that would be one thing that would be helpful to get a little bit more of a formal uh, okay, sure. um, assessment of. Okay. Um, the only uh, last question I have is I noticed on one of your plans at the corner that you have it. A tree and a plaque to remain. What's what is um, that? What's the plaque? Yep. I think Katie knows better than I know. I do. Um, the plaque is actually for the Knight family um, oh, okay. from the Thames because I believe um, the property was originally owned by the Knights and um, sold to the Thames way, way, way back. Um, so they did have a relationship with the family. It's going to stay. That, that's on our property, on Katie's property, and we'll, we'll uh, put an easement around it or we'll, we'll otherwise protect it. There is a tree that's been planted with a with the black on the rock. Okay. We'll, we'll protect that. That's on that corner. I might have read it in there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's about where we're going to, uh, we're offering an easement for the sidewalk construction. Actually, the sidewalk would run right in front of, right in front of that. Okay. Um, 
No, I, I think it's going to be a great addition to that neighborhood, so looking forward to seeing more of it. I'm all done. Thanks, Roger. Susan? Um, I don't have much to add. I, I think the, um, it's to the town's credit that this much concern is being given to the historical value of this property, and I trust that the Historical Society will come up with what they feel is the, the best plan. Um, it's a very complicated. I mean, I spent a bunch of time on the telephone <laughs> with the Historical Society trying to figure out just what, how do you determine the value of this particular building. And I think that um, moving it may be the answer, who knows. But I am reminded about what happened when we did the, um, mm -hmm. the new location on Route 1. That used to be, the, I don't remember what it was called, um, Danish Village, right? Now well, that was a huge thing that happened in Scarborough, Danish Village. It's called Danish Village. And what we ended up doing, because it was so far gone, was minimal, but it was very, it was very accessible. Okay, we took the arch and put it in the, in the town park with a thing that says, this is what this is all about. And it's entirely possible that something like this that actually goes out into the community and says we're going to put this building someplace where we can talk about what it actually was is a lot better than leaving it where it is. But I trust that the people who are actively involved in this can come up with something that we we'll, that we'll be happy with. Um, the only other question I had was when you were showing the um, um, outside the building, the elevations. Okay. The one we didn't mention was the very last one. No. Okay, the one at the bottom. Where does that face? This will face the, the playground. Playground. Correct. Okay. So is these are the doors. Down that Chicago that Street, is that what I'm going to see? No, this is what you'll see on Saco Street. Okay, and as I'm coming down on um, 22. 22 yeah. County. Right, so okay. this is this is I the end. I'm this because but we're really in big here on, um, you know, what you see as you drive by. And when I first saw that last elevation, I thought, well, that's pretty boring. But if I was a kid playing in the playground, I probably wouldn't care. <laughs> so. I guess that takes care of that problem. Um, the traffic analysis, I, I'm looking forward to seeing more about traffic analysis, and I don't, not right now. And I would like us to, I'm not sure where we ended up with the internal circulation designed to be more compact to reduce the amount of impervious surface. And if there is anything that can be done, I mean, this is just talking time right yep. here. I'll take a look at it. That would be great. Other than that, I think we've covered everything that concerns me. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Susan. Um, and I, before I forget about it, I'll pick up on your last point. I, I think the, the um, homework to clarify what sort of vehicle might be used for drop-off and pick-up relates to that, at least somewhat, the extent to which the applicant might be able to reduce the amount of impervious surface there. So that'll be something we'll, we'll look for for next time. Um, yeah, I won't belabor all the points, but um, as my fellow board members have uh, indicated, I think you're, you're definitely off to a good start, um, showing a lot of sensitivity to the aquifer protection overlay district. Um, and I think it was a helpful overview of the site topography and, and your stormwater treatment approach. Uh, so. So that's definitely um, off on the right track. Um, look forward to seeing a more formal traffic analysis, the results of the, um, the uh, sort of more detailed stormwater, um, stormwater planning and, and the nitrate plume analysis that you mentioned. I think it just come in and was looking promising. So we'll, we'll look for that next time. Um, in terms of the, uh, the architecture, I think it's definitely promising. Um, I personally would would, would welcome the removal of the cupola. Um, sometimes there are mixed feelings about that. Um, but I think you can certainly achieve uh, compliance with the design standards and, and that look without having to pop that on there. We've already thought about that. So that's probably the way sounds it's like you had, had me on that, so that's, that's good. Um, I think sometimes people think that 
the town requires that people put before <laughs> on things just so that they have the New England vernacular. But um, it sounds like you're taking a thoughtful approach to that, which is great. And along those lines, it would be helpful um, for next time when you come in with a more fully developed plan set to have at least one perspective rendering that would show the view of the maybe that corner corner of the building from the Saco Street intersection. Um, and then make sure that the, the rendering or renderings that would include the, uh, the dumpster enclosure the proposed in that proposed location, that that be clearly shown so we have a sense of what that sight line is and what that screening would be. I appreciate your dilemma there and desire to keep that away from the, the playground. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think um, I oh, and I, I do want to thank you for your comment on the um, potential for a diagonal, as you described it, a diagonal easement across the corner for a future sidewalk placement. Um, and, and again, that's having to sort of think ahead because we're not quite there yet in terms of having an actual sidewalk network, but that's something that some of us feel pretty strongly about, so I appreciate your willingness to consider that. Um, beyond that, um, I, oh, and I'll just reiterate, I talked about it briefly before, but on the, on the historic preservation um, front, I think, um, well, first I do appreciate all the effort and thought that's clearly been given to how to approach that and how to preserve something one way or another, and there are multiple options there, uh, it sounds like, and I, I just want to reiterate that would like to see a, you know, a more formal kind of memo from the, the committee. I know the chair happens to be sitting here tonight. So thank you for that, and then we can kind of factor that in. Yeah, we'll, we'll, it sounds we'll like definitely meet right. once or twice more Great. and get their feedback. So uh, I have one quick question. Sure. If I may. Uh, on the, I haven't presented before Scalborough before, so I'm not sure this uh, answer. On, um, would it be best for our traffic engineer to attend the next meeting? We have questions. Do you do you think? I mean, what's the normal procedure? Usually, does the traffic engineer attend? And you know, you have those that kind of direct question. Do you do you think? <laughs> There's certainly you can speak to it. Or should we wait broader. to see what the peer review is? I think if we the, see the study, yeah. I think. Go ahead. Yeah, I think. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, mean, I, can I think largely it depends on the complexity okay. and the, um, yeah, the nature of the of the analysis and and what our peer reviewer and staff review. Yeah, I, didn't, so I we'll, didn't know that was a loaded we'll, question. We'll continue, no. we'll continue no. to discuss. You are, okay, right. Yep. I'll get feedback from you yep. later. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say staff does a good job of sort of vetting that stuff and Great. determining whether that, that's something that's helpful. So. Great. Any, anything else from us at this point? I don't, no. no, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next item is a consent item. Merle Hartford Painting LLC requests final subdivision approval for 93 Running Hill Road, Assessor's Map R35, Lot 18. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, this is a consent item. That means it's been before this board on a couple of occasions. Uh, last time we reviewed it, the principal remaining question really had to do with the amount of disturbance that was going to happen overall. And once we sort of uncovered that answer and it was going to be under an acre, the applicant's gone through, revised their plans, has all the requisite notations that staff and board members had asked for. Um, and as, as I said, I think at the last meeting, the board um, was comfortable with the direction things were heading, moved, moved this con to consent, and typically when that's done, so long as uh, all the items have been satisfied, the board usually uh, dispenses with the matter pretty quickly. So all right. with that. Thank you, Jay. Does the applicant have anything to add if they're here? I no. don't need to make a presentation. Just yeah. put that out there. Oh, no, thank you. All right, great. Anyone have any comments or concerns? I would All right. Just say this is a perfect example of how the system works. The way it is very, very much according to the book. So. Definitely. Um, so, in light of that, I will move that we, the board, grant final subdivision approval for 93 Running Hill Road, Assessor's Map R35, lot 18. Actually, we do have a motion, don't we? 
I get to do some real reading. I move to approve the application of Merle Hartford Painting LLC plans prepared by BH2M engineers for the final subdivision plan of land at 93 Running Hill Road with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the applicant proposes a three lot residential subdivision with access off of Running Hill Road, a new road. The residential subdivision is located within the Running Hill Transition District and the Aquifer Protection Overlay District and has been designed accordingly. Based on review of the materials submitted, I find that the subdivision meets section Section 4 and 6 of the subdivision ordinance, ensuring that the development meets minimum standards for the protection of public health, safety, and welfare, welfare with the following conditions. Number one, prior to the release of the attested final subdivision <coughs> plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, the applicant shall pay the required traffic impact fee of $2,071.94. Number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit for lot two or lot three, a detailed site grading plan shall be submitted for the applicable lot. Grading plans to be reviewed and approved by the town engineer. And number three, prior to the start of work within the public right of way, the applicant is to secure a road opening permit from the public works department. Second. Have a second, any discussion? All in favor? That's your name. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and our final action item of the night. JDR Trust 2 requests a site plan and subdivision plan review for a mixed use development at 25 Plaza Drive, Assessor's Map R58, Lot 32M. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, staff, I need to recuse myself. As staff under my direct supervision will be working for this applicant, so okay. I'm going to excuse myself. Thank you for letting us know. Uh -huh. So, make Rick a voting member if we get to that point on this item. Jay, would you like to sure um, for this one? I know board members have seen this one before, so I'll, I'll keep my. Uh, my introduction brief, but this is a proposal for a multi-use or multi-building uh, site plan in the TVC district in the Oak Hill Plaza, particularly 25 Plaza Drive. The applicant seeking to um, improve the property with a, uh, see there's an existing building, um, they're looking to add a bank, and then also a three-story mixed-use building, which would be uh, office res uh, retail on the first floor and residential on the second floor. Um, as I said, we've reviewed this item a few times before and we've really worked through a lot of the details. I think in terms of staff review comments, you will have received uh, review comments from staff as well as Bill Bray doing a traffic peer review and Woodard and Kern looking at engineering issues. Um, in terms of staff comments, the, the principal sort of remaining issue as we identified really has to do with the impact at the uh, Plaza Drive and Route 1 intersection, <coughs> um, particularly with um, the, the uh, increased traffic, um, particularly with the bank, so it has a high traffic turnover, um, and so we, um, to date, the uh, intersection, as I said, at Plaza Drive and Route 1 is currently um, not meeting standards, and so um, we need to be sure that the applicant at least isn't making any further issue, um, exacerbating those issues, and um, I think Bill Bray sort of touched on a couple of different uh, ways the applicant might want to consider addressing those, and I think they're prepared to talk with the board about that further um, based on my earlier discussions. Um, so I think that's really the principal issue. I do know, want to note that at the last meeting, at least one board member, if not others echoed, I believe, had uh, really wanted to be sure that the internal uh, vehicular circulation was uh, appropriately designed. 
um, when Bill Bray sort of, re when Bill Bray looked at this, um, he really, his comments centered around, you know, if the, if the fix, if you will, or the mitigation at the Plaza Drive Route 1 intersection was to be the development of the easement area that's being proposed to the abutting property, then we might want to take a look at some other alignments. But if that's really, you know, if that easement area isn't going to be that mitigating factor, traffic's going to be directed elsewhere, then the internal circulation, you know, didn't have, didn't see any major concerns with. Um, so um, we did ask him to speak to that, and I did have a phone conversation with him on that. Um, you know, again, I, you know, we have a couple of other staff comments, but I think um, at this point I'll sort of leave it at that level and here to answer further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. And I'll hand over to the applicant. So thank you very much. I'll try to be really quick. You guys have had a long night. Um, so just to kind of uh, orient everyone for the rendering, I do have a sorry, Steve Berg here with from JDR Trust, um, and I think he'll be able to answer any questions you might have on the easement and traffic, and I'll try to answer a few myself. So just to orient you, this would be Plaza Drive. Uh, we're leaving the bird's eye up so you can see it more in context. The bank with its um, drive-through, uh, the renovated courtyard building with the new facade and the proposed multi-use uh, building. Um, On-street parking is shown. Um, we're showing the improved sidewalks uh, and circulation. And then, uh, I guess, oh, Talking about, let me get my bearings here. Is it Oak Hill Drive? We Plaza about Drive? Plaza Drive? No, Oak Hill. Plaza Drive is yeah, Oak Hill. McDonald down. Oak Hill Terrace yeah. comes up from the post office area and intersects. Right. And we, we need a, a mic. Yeah. Sorry. And we, and we discussed, I don't, I, don't, I don't recall any discussion, and maybe there was a meeting I missed. Okay. But I don't recall any discussion about having a, a, a um, right of way at the extension of Adams. So the right of way, yeah. the right of way, it's, it's not a right of way that we're proposing. Um, you mean Adams here? Yes. Yeah, we're not proposing any thoroughway here. There's a connectivity easement for future connectivity. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Right. So what we had talked about, if you remember at the site walk, we looked at it. There's a, over a five foot grade change from this point to this point, it's, it's a connection that can't be made. So you would essentially have a, a ramp that would so speed that you couldn't make the connection. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a wetland. It's also a wetland through there. It's so a wetland? It's a wetland. Oh. 
through there. So we had talked about it on the site walk and then at the very next meeting, which would have been January, um, that we came back. Uh, just, that's when we started showing the connectivity there because we've been working with staff to try and find the best connection point. And from the back property line, this represents the best opportunity for future connectivity. And that would go right, right into where Pat's parking lot is. Right. It actually goes in. Right now it goes into three propane tanks at the back of Foley's okay. property. But it's, in terms of alignment and the best opportunity to connect um, on this property is right here. I think the idea is that that's not a connection that's going to be made with this development, but really what it's setting up for is when redevelopment happens on the abutting property that interconnection could possibly be made. So it's, it's really down the road. No, I understand that. Okay. I'm just wondering how much of an improvement that, that connection is going to make. This is, and I understand there's more of a problem going going to the Oak, Oak Hill Drive, extending that, you know, but you know, maybe for us to do I guess that was a meeting maybe I didn't attend. He had the discussion about was the consensus was that that's where it was going to be? Okay, all right. Then I won't belabor that thing. Um, the other thing is, oh, I, I actually um, I go by the place all the time, but before tonight's meeting, I purposely drove through there again, and I, I drove out um, right where uh, Walgreens is. To go out that way there, um, and. I just want to mention to you the sign there. There's a, there's a sign that says right turn lane only, right after Walgreens on the Route 1. Okay. All right. And hidden behind it is no left turn. So that could be a problem with cars going out and trying to make a left turn because you can't clearly see no left turn sign. It's just like a housekeeping thing, okay? Um, I don't know. I think it seems to me reading over this that that route, that that entrance to Route One there is still going to be a problematic situation. I don't, I don't know how to resolve it. I'm not sure that I agree that Adams, the extension of Adams, you know, ultimately would be would solve that problem. Uh, otherwise, I I like everything about the project. I think it looks good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, a couple of things that um, basically is coming along very nicely. I'm looking forward to seeing this done. By the way, yippee for the new sign on Route 1. I mean, I'm that I live long enough to see that happen. Yes, sir. Go for it. And it's going to be as nice as the one that's upside. Um, yeah. Yeah, Walmart. Walmart. I think I'm Walmart. I know it's not Walmart. That's very exciting to me. I think the biggest problem still is what to do with this one. I just don't know how much it's going to be resolved by anything that we can do design-wise with what's happening here. I trust, <laughs> I trust the people who understand traffic a heck of a lot better than I do. You know, because I live on Blackwood Road. So I come down, I come down Route 1, I go south on Route 1 all the time. And the entrance from Route 1 onto Plaza Drive right now is a piece of cake if it's not rush hour. What is rush hour? It already backs up the Hanover Drive. And I don't think that this is going to create that much more of a demand that it's going to be, you know, gridlock. I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that something has to be looked at in terms of there were so many different suggestions of how to deal with that in terms of material, and I don't have the knowledge to understand engineering-wise the best way to go. But I do think that prohibiting all left-hand movements to and from Plaza Drive with construction of a raised delta island in the um, <coughs> like the throat of the Plaza Drive approach to the intersection is something to be really considered. I mean, that alone will help. Just no left turn in, no left turn in. But it's going to be done in such a way that people can't yes. cheat. Yeah. I mean, feel free. Um, well, again, it's one of those 
Yeah, I'm not a traffic engineer. I don't pretend to be one. I don't I'm a practical that. person. I've been on this property for over 30 years. I know. There's times a day when you can make a left turn out there without even stopping, because I've seen people do it. Um, <laughs> exactly. And I don't recommend it. Um, what we've talked about and gone back and forth with, because I think one side, you get engineers that overkill the design, and then there's other ways I think they're simpler, like a, you know, at least try things first before you you know, over-engineer it. Um, and we're willing to talk about you know, no left turns out of Plaza Drive. Um, it's a big concession, I believe, because again, I don't feel the problem is this 24 hours a day. There's limited times a day where it's a problem. Um, you know, I've read a lot of traffic engineering reports and getting two traffic engineers to agree on stuff a lot of times doesn't happen. Um, so that is something we we're willing to consider because from a practical standpoint, um, I think it does solve a big common problem, I mean, especially for people who want to make a right turn going south. Um, so we, you know, I think we can accomplish that with signage. I've discussed it with Jay about trying that approach with some hammer over our head to say if this isn't working, come back. Um, you know, we, you know like there's that. plenty of ways to deal with that um, without, you know, because I think by making no left turns in the property, I think you're going to create a lot more problems in other places. Um, you see, that's what I like about what, what you just said is try the simple answer, and if it doesn't work, have it have it very yeah. clearly stated that we have to look at it again. Yes, because we don't we're, know. We're very comfortable with that. I, I'm comfortable approach. with that as long as it gets written down somewhere. <laughs> but hanging around long enough to know it needs to be written down somewhere. Um, I still don't like the circulation from the bank. I'm not going to like the circulation from the bank. I don't see any solutions to the circulation from the bank. Um, I bank at Seaport, right? Yeah. Okay, so you come into Seaport and you've got to immediately go, you only can go right, and you go right through the parking lot, and then you take a left, and then you go, I mean, it's like, seriously, it's a little bank. It's a little, it's a little hassle. It's not a problem. But this is, this is bigger. This is, I don't like it. If I were going to be entering into this bank off from Plaza Drive, if I look at if I look at the drive, right? Right hand side. So I come in and I go to the window. So are you coming in the I'm one way in? That way. Yeah. I'm going to go to the window. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to park, I, I'm, or, or I'm going to park. Let's look at the window. Now, in order to get out, I have to go through the parking lot. Right? Yep. Let's go through the parking lot. And that's a pretty good sized parking lot. You know, I mean, how many, how many? It's about 10 spaces, uh, maybe 12 10, spaces? Yeah, 12 spaces. The other alternative is to go all the way behind the buildings and go through another parking lot to come out further down on Plaza Drive. I mean, this is, and I, I don't know, maybe what I'm asking for is, is some kind of, I don't know what I'm asking for. I guess I just have to say I don't I don't feel comfortable with it, but I don't see any solution to it. I don't see anything else that can be done. Okay, moving right along. Um, by the way, thank you for the changes that you're making to, I appreciate you bringing these in. I was absent when they were first given out. And I really like the changes that you're making to the existing building. Thank you. It's going to be very, very much of an update. Um, what was the other one? I guess that my main thing is traffic. Banks are oh, and I said signage, and oh, phasing. There was something about like, the stuff up here, and not 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 a real consensus as to how to phase. Oh, yeah, I just just staff looked at the phasing plan. Um, the sidewalk and on-street parking that's directly in front of the three-story building, mm -hmm. the mixed-use building. Right. Was identified to be part of phase three, or and it, again these C, right? right. I'm sorry, I right. shouldn't use the lettering. Right. Right. The, the, the numbers <laughs> don't necessarily equate to sequencing, right. but it, it, as staff looked at it, it seemed to make sense to have that on-street parking and that sidewalk as part of that building and that yeah. phase. Yeah, we're in agreement with that. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Originally, when I did it, I assumed the bank would go first, but I didn't want to prioritize it, so I thought the bank would go, and then the, all the improvements would go. And 
No, but we would we would, we would tie all that mm -hmm. this stuff in the air gets built. The sidewalk and the on the street parking will go at the same time. Okay. And then because I'm when I'm not a landscape person and a design person, uh, the signage going to be something that you've got going out like on the building. Are you going to have any freestanding signs? Yeah, the there's freestanding signs in the application packet, I believe. Um, and I believe they're on the drawings as well. Actually, I'm not going to orient myself. So in tab four are all the freestanding signs. Um, I think so Susan, you're referring to for the actual property itself. Yeah, property. Oh, yeah. Right. No, um, these, 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 yeah. Not the wayfinding signs. Right. Um, we've been trying to limit those as much as possible, um, and we've been very selective, like with the. The newer building, we put a 10 mm -hmm. miles to drive. Mm -hmm. um, we've tried to, to you know, have building identification numbers, obviously, for you know, people to find the buildings. Um, <coughs> and then we push back a lot of the tenants and trying to reduce signs. I mean, I think if you'll drive by that building, you can see the type of signs. Um, and I think we'd have to come back you know, for a modification or something. If Is we there a way that we can that. get involved in that at the, at the planning board level, not the planning board, but the planning department level, in that if there's going to be, if what you're doing right now, the concept of how you're doing it, is I think really great. Thanks. But if something comes up where you have a tenant who insists on doing something different, kind of just get approval from staff or? Yeah, that's about a sign. Yeah, I mean. Me? Are you talking about for freestanding sign? Is that what you mean? Yeah, freestanding. It's, it's you know, I mean, if they can put a plaque on the building, what they've been doing now is not really a problem, but we're adding a bank and banks are really big on wanting good signage, and we don't know what's going to go in the other locations. I think a monumental sign um, would come back anyway for. Um, they would have to get a sign permit at yeah. the minimum, and typically then the code officer, when they get a sign permit application, brings it to planning staff attention and we say yes this was approved or no this hasn't been approved let's, let's take it to the board. I'm yeah. very happy to this is I mean I started the signs and I'm ending the signs but I am going to be picky because we don't go back to my hat for landscape. Landscape is fine, no problem. Except that what the heck is a ZF? Zalcova? What is that? A Zalcova is uh it's like an elm. Like an elm, so it doesn't get too terribly tall. Elms do, so. Yeah, Zalcova's will get quite, quite large. Okay, and then up in the far left-hand corner of this um, landscaping plan, yeah. there's a little sign that says it's called a TC. Are you sure it's supposed to be a T-O? Because I don't see any TC anywhere. Oh, you kind of mislabel. It's, those are lindens. Yeah. You caught a mess. Okay, I'm done. I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel? Susan strikes fear to the hearts of folks with their editing prowess there. Um, I have some of the similar concerns that have been raised in terms of traffic and in terms of the circulation. I'm not sure we're ever going to solve the traffic problems uh, with connection to Route 1. Um, in the winter, yeah, you can turn left without a problem. In the summer, you can wait for a long time to even turn right. Uh, but I think um, trying something and seeing how it works, and then if it doesn't, kind of going back to the drawing board is a good way to go. Uh, I do want to commend you for what I see as a, a fully integrated parcel there um, as part of a, a community with the bank and the, the uh, changes to the existing building uh, and that new building there, seeing it as you've got it portrayed there and on the sketch plans, I, I think I like it. I think you've done a, a good job, but still a little worried about the circulation in back of the bank. But I don't have any suggestions for what you can do about it, so thank you. Thank you. I think it's, you did a good job. It's a lot of work. Um, 
I was trying to figure out how you loaded and unloaded material like into the retail space, but I think I found a little picture of the truck that shows that you can park a truck out back and still drive by. Right. There's all the little individual yeah. entries in that. Right. Yeah. Um, I kind of anticipate people are going to drive back there and out this way. That's just, I think, what I would do. So maybe I think everybody will do that. Um, but it's going to be somewhat limited. At, it, there's not going to be people coming in and out of those doors other than the, the no. No, I mean, the tenant yeah. mix that's there and historically been there, there's been almost no retail. It's all pretty much professional service offices. Okay. So there's not much loading in right. other than people kicking their trash. Yeah, I think you I think you did the um, the very best you could with the space that you have. So and I think Susan's pretty much covered the evergreen, so um, I don't know really I don't have anything negative. Maybe it's good. Thanks. All right. So um, I don't have a ton to add. Um, I think clearly the big headline or takeaway from this is that um, sort of the, I think what is now an understanding about the kind of uh, iterative approach to the, the traffic movements with the no left turn out and um, sort of see how things go. Um, there are um, certainly some other issues and details to work through, some of which have been raised and some of which are in staff comments. Um, I'm glad we got phasing clarification. Um, I also commend you for the work you've done to kind of pull all this together, and I think it's, it's certainly going to be a, an improvement um, to the existing building and to that area in general. And I'm, as much as you know, the additional activity raises concerns about traffic and traffic movement. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's certainly a good thing that this area is going to be more activated internally and that you're sort of filling that in. I know it's been a long process. Um, so look forward to seeing that come together. And so you know, with the understanding again that there are some, some of these details and open questions to work through, um, I think and I, and I think it's the sense of the board that um, we're satisfied enough with the general direction of the project that we're I think ready to um, consider preliminary subdivision approval. I don't see anyone disagreeing. So um, with that, I do not have a motion, but I will simply move uh, that the board uh, grant preliminary subdivision approval to JDR Trust 2 for mixed-use development at 25 Plaza Drive, assessor's map R58, lot 32M. Okay. And second, is there a further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Do we have a staff report, Jay? Uh, yep. I have two things to report on. One has to do with the comprehensive plan update. Just, uh, and I think I might have mentioned this before, but if I have it, on May 23rd, we will have our first official public kickoff meeting. Um, Exact time and exact location still to be determined, but uh, we will be making any more public announcements about that. But want to be sure you all are thinking about that and hopefully putting that on your calendars because that will be, um, we think, a, a, both an important and exciting meeting. So, um, what time is that meeting, Jim? I'm not sure of the time yet. It'll probably be six or six thirty, something in that realm. It'll be in the evening. And then the other item I want to update folks on is the Long Range Planning Committee is working on the Higgins Beach um, uh, um, Code audit. Um, that's one of these provisions when when that when that uh, zoning was put in place maybe uh, a little while ago. There was this idea about doing an audit, see how it's working. It's really a form-based code, which is different than number of our other codes, and so just let you folks know that we are conducting the audit, working with our consultants, and we'll be holding a sort of a, what we're calling a public open house on June 11th um, down at the uh, Higgins Beach Association Clubhouse, um, and that will be 
sort of in the 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. time frame, and it's an open house where people can come and go and sort of talk about how things are working or not. So, what day of the week is that? Do you that's know? actually on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and again, we'll provide more information as that sort of um, solidifies and gets closer. But want to keep you updated on those. Thanks, too. And presumably, it'll be a little warmer that day than it was. <laughs> No problem. Those of us on the <laughs> planning committee who took our field trip out there That's on the right. coldest day in March. Uh, but in all seriousness, it was very interesting to see, kind of in real time, how owners are owners and architects are utilizing the code and some of the maybe misfires in some ways, at least in terms of how the, um, the some of the designs and the construction are maybe not quite matching up with what was was envisioned. Uh, but that's all part of the process, and um, so I think uh, it'll be something else to look forward to. And I think overall it's been a really good process and, um, and achieve its goals. Um, do you have an administrative amendment report? Yes, I do have one thing to report. Uh, down at the um, garage barbecue, this is 3 East Grand Avenue, um, they were going to put, they had the building had an existing roof sign that needed to get removed because once you have a non-conforming sign, you come through site plan, you need to address it. They were going to put a parapet so, so they could keep that sign. When they actually went to build the parapet, or you know, the builders got in there and said, "Well, wait, we're going to have drainage issues here." So they have now eliminated the parapet and are just putting the sign a wall-based sign. Um, so it really didn't change the building in a meaningful way. I reviewed it with the chair, so that's been. That project is underway and we continue to monitor it as we typically do. We're hoping to open next month. Uh, any planning board correspondence? No? Planning board comments? I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Jay and Angela or however soft comments were done this month by identifying all the different ordinances that apply. I don't know. It, it just really was a great job this month. Thank you so much. I'll appreciate that. Um, anyone else? I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? We do have Thank a plan to sign. Uh, just the one that we approved tonight. They brought in a mylar. The, uh, of course they did. The uh, <laughs> hang on there. So, uh, a couple of signatures on.